Hallo. Good morning, everyone. We'd like to request our GNOME Foundation members and guests to take the reserved seats, please. Take it? Okay. Embrace the winds of change, for in the realm of open source, they carry the seeds of innovation, nurturing a landscape where technology evolves hand in hand with collaboration. Ladies and gentlemen, I, Shaili Manander, and I, Akriti Das, welcome you all to the NUM Asia Summit 2023. We all, we have our NUM Foundation member, sorry, my sincere apologies. We have, we have our NUM co-founder, Mr. Federico Mena Quintero, and our keynote speaker, Mr. S Mr. Justin Flory, and Mr. Hempal Strester with us today. We're thrilled to have you here for an exciting journey into the world of open source innovation. GNOME is a non-profit software environment project that is free and open source. Together, the contributor community and the foundation built a computing platform and software ecosystem made entirely of free software that is elegant, efficient, and simple to use. Without further ado, let's begin this incredible conference. I'd like to invite Ms. our executive director, Ms. Holy Million, with her welcome remarks. She would be connecting with us online.
Now let's invite our convener for this event, Mr. Bhisan Khatiora, for his welcome speech. Hello. Hello, everyone. My name is Bishan Katiola, and I'm the convener for this event. Uh, you guys must be seeing me running here and there earlier. <laughs> uh, we were in a rush. That's why I was also involved. Uh, apologies for the delay. Uh, and I would like to welcome you all with this speech. Uh, namaste and good morning. Distinguished guests, esteemed speakers, respected participants, and dear friends of the open source community. It is with my immense joy and pride that I stand before you to welcome each and every one of you to the GNOME Asia Summit 2023 held here in Kathmandu, Nepal. This summit is not just gathering, it's a convergence of minds, a celebration of collaboration, and a testament to the power of open source ideals. As we embark on this journey over the next two days, those who have been contributing in GNOME and open source community, let's carry it on with the higher spirit. And those who haven't started yet, Let's grab this opportunity and turn ourselves into an active contributor to the GNOME and open source community. Nepal, with its rich history, warm hospitality, and vibrant culture, provides the perfect backdrop for us to come together and share our experiences, insights, and innovations. It's our place where tradition meets technology and where the spirit of community aligns seamlessly with the open source spirit. The GNOME Asia Summit is not just an event, it's a platform to learn, share, and grow together. From thought-provoking keynotes to hands-on workshops, from deep technical discussions to casual networking, the next few days promises to be a journey to, of exploration, enlightenment, and empowerment. I would like to express our heartfelt gratitude to the organizing team, both local and international, volunteers, and all those who have worked tirelessly to make this summit a reality. Your dedication is the driving force behind the success of this event. To our esteemed speaker, thank you for sharing your knowledge and insights. Your contributions are invaluable, and we are honored to have you guide us through the GNOME and open source technologies. To our participants, your presence here adds immense value to the summit. Please take this opportunity to connect, collaborate, and establish strong relationships that extend beyond this summit. As we delve into the GNOME Asia Summit 2023, let's, let us embrace the spirit of openness, inclusivity, and innovation. May this summit be a catalyst for new ideas, collaborations, and friendships that continues long after the event concludes. Once again, a warm welcome to each of you. Let the Genome Asia Summit 2023 in Nepal be a memorable chapter in our journey towards a more open, collaborative, and connected future. Thank you, and let the summit begin. Thank you, Mr. Kadiwada, for your warm welcome. We kindly request our keynote speaker, Mr. Justin Flory, to come on the stage for his presentation on the topic of open source launchpad, a then and now look at the tech careers.
morning. Can you all hear me okay? Perfect. So my name is Justin, and today I want to talk to you about the Open Source Launchpad, a then and now look at tech careers and how open source fits into the puzzle. So if you've ever heard me on a stage before talking about open source, you'll have probably heard me say this before. Open source is a method that we use to develop and distribute software, and it's a set of best practices that make software and build teams that make software. It's also a movement that's based on ideals and philosophy that go beyond only code. And it's also rooted in a belief that software has an impact that is greater than any one of us and has, there are certain freedoms that should also be protected. And lastly, open source is a culture. It is a collection of people, values, and ideas that take the form of, that, or just so happen to take the form of software projects and communities. So in today's talk, I'm gonna ter tell you a little bit about this 40-year-old story about the open source, uh, about this open source story. I will share a little bit about who I am, uh, what exactly is this free stuff all about, and what is the future of working on free stuff. So a little bit about me. Next slide. Uh, my name is Justin. I'm originally from the United States. A little bit about some of the things I'm doing recently. In October 2022, uh, I joined the Red Hat, uh, Red Hat's open source program office as a community architect for the Fedora project, which is a Linux distribution. Uh, Fedora is the upstream for one of Red Hat's best known commercial products, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, or RHEL. Before that, from June 2020 to October 2022, I worked with the UNICEF Office of Innovation as an open source technical advisor. Uh, and there I worked uh, as an open source coach where I guided uh, different international startups uh, who were working on building an open source product. And I helped, uh, helped them think around how to build a community around their work. Before that, I've participated in various open source projects and communities, and my academic days are not that far behind me. Uh, I studied networking and systems administration in, at my university. I had the option to actually minor or take a, a courses in free and open source software, and I graduated in May 2020, so peak, peak pandemic times. Next slide, please. Uh, so long before I actually had my first job in tech, even before I started at my university, there was Fedora. The Fedora project is a community of people working together to build a free and open source software platform and to collaborate on and share user-focused solutions built on that platform. It's kind of a mouthful. So what we say in plain English is, we make an operating system and we make it easy for you to do useful stuff with it. So, I started participating as a contributor to Fedora in 2015, right around when I had just gotten my high school diploma. I attended the contributor conference for our community that we call Flock. At the, in 2015, it was in Rochester, New York, and that was coincidentally the week before I was going to start my, my university program. So I decided I was gonna come up early and check out what all this open source and Fedora stuff was. And since then, Fedora has always been a part of what I do. I've contributed to various parts of Fedora, mostly in a non-engineering capacity. Uh, the pictures that are shown here are various photos from when I would go represent Fedora at conferences and events and hackathons uh, across the United States. And after seven years of being a volunteer contributor, because I was doing all these things kind of for fun and for learning and knowledge, uh, eventually I was lucky enough to land a full-time job to where all I get to do is work on Fedora. Uh, so that part, uh, that part makes my job, or the part that makes my job so wonderful is the people, the amazing people that I get to work with. Some of them are my colleagues at Red Hat. Some of them are people who work on Fedora as part of other companies. And other folks are just volunteers and people who do it because they, they enjoy it or they're learning something as they're, as they're doing it. Next slide. Uh, so around the same time I started, to, or around the same time I started to use Fedora Linux, I also started using the GNOME desktop about 10 years ago. Uh, I've tried other desktops time to time, but I always end up coming back to GNOME. Uh, so this presentation was actually created with GNOME 45.1 and Fedora Linux 39. 
In 2022, I attended the GNOME User and Developers Everywhere Conference, or GWADEC, uh, for the first time. And there, I organized some workshops and activities for, the com for community building and DEI based on learnings from the Fedora community. Uh, so in the spirit of the open source way, together with uh, one of my community members, Yona Azizaj, we teamed up to bring some of these workshops to the GWADEC conference. Uh, so while I was there, that was where I came to know many members of the GNOME community. I got to meet old friends and made many new friends as well. Uh, so fast forward to 2020, right around when I graduated, I was working at UNICEF to evaluate open source projects and companies uh, in UNICEF's innovation fund. The UNICEF Innovation Fund provides equity-free funding to startup companies around the world, uh, provided they are willing to release their intellectual property and their software under open source licenses. So naturally, I got more involved with uh, uh, communities because I was trying to measure this community health and sustainability in the companies that UNICEF was working with. I actually worked with a team here in, in Nepal that was working with open source hardware and drones. Well, I'm gonna come back to that one a little bit later. Uh, in the picture here, I was presenting at ChaosCon Europe in 2020 about the scoring system that me and my former UNICEF colleague, Cecilia Shapiro, had come up with to measure the health of open source startup companies for UNICEF. So let's get into the heart of this presentation. Uh, next slide. What is this free stuff? I'm gonna tell you a short story about this free stuff that we call open source. Why do people care so much about this stuff? Next slide. So free stuff can mean a lot of things, but in the context of today's presentation, today is, we're going to be talking about open source and freedom. So here's the definition that is uh, defined by the Open Source Initiative, which is a nonprofit organization that's stewarded for over, uh, actually now it's over 20 years, has stewarded this, actually 25 now, has stewarded this definition of what is a legal definition of open source as far as licenses and legal aspects are concerned. There are some people who use the term open source that may talk about some of these things, uh, but something isn't really open source unless it includes all of these components. Freely used, uh, you can modify it or remix it, and you can share or uh, distribute your changes with anyone. So sometimes you might see this written as FOSS, which is free and open source software. Uh, so by a quick show of hands, next slide. Uh, so how many of you people in the room recognize all of the logos on the screen? That's most of the room here. I, normally then I ask how many of you recognize half of the logos, but I think there's a lot of, you know, these are some pretty common logos up here. So you know, this is par part of the point is that open source is, is everywhere. It, it's in your pocket, it's in this room, it's powering the internet. In fact, there would not be an internet without open source. Next slide. So uh, we're gonna be talking a little bit, I'll talk a little bit about the Linux operating system. So in 2014, this study found that 79.3% of all public servers on the internet ran Linux or another Unix-based operating system. Eight years later, as recent as August 2022, that number has hardly changed at all. We're at 80.2%, according to a survey from W3 Tech Surveys. You'll also recognize some of these other logos that are on the screen as well, building web infrastructure like the Apache HTTPD web server, which is an open source web server that delivers content. When you go to a website, that's what's serving it to your browser on your computer or your phone. Uh, there's also various other technologies like Node.js or Python Flask, Ruby on Rails that you can use to build uh, websites. Uh, in this room right now, like, show of hands, how many people have an Android phone? That's like almost everyone in the room. So, uh, you know, Android is probably one of the best known examples of an open source project. It's uh, created by Google. Uh, Firefox as a browser is also a very common one and uh, LibreOffice for doing document editing and kind of a free, uh, free and open source Microsoft Office alternative. It's also in code. And I like this example because you actually get a pretty diverse range of examples here from the Python programming language, which is stewarded by the Python Software Foundation, which is a, a nonprofit organization. You also have .NET, which is Microsoft's language, which uh, 
somewhat recently in the history of .NET was made to be an open source language. It did not start as open source, but Microsoft later made many parts of it more open. And then Apple as well, for both the, all the Mac and iPhone platforms is Swift is their big programming language. And that's also an open source programming language. So, you know, there's a lot of talk about this public code, but like why do, like what are the reasons people want to put their, their software out in the open where anyone can find it? I think the easiest way of thinking about it is often around control, training, security, and stability. Control, because it's always possible to study and understand how something works, and nobody can tell you what or how to use the software. You have that right. Uh, for training, learning gets to happen in the public, and you get connected to a wider ecosystem beyond something that's a closed source work. Uh, and you can get faster feedback in many cases. Uh, security as well, it can be easier to audit. You know, if you have a team of five people who have a proprietary project, only those five people are gonna be seeing their code. But if you have an open source project where anyone is able to see it and access it, you have a much wider pool of people who can also audit it and review it and report bugs and raise security issues with the code as well. Uh, and lastly, stability around having uh, open common standards makes it easier to build software that's interoperable. You go from one platform to another and when you build on standards, it's easier for those things to translate regardless of what platform or, or what uh, base you're building on. It's also easier to fork something and continue on if the original project is no longer able to continue. Sometimes you'll hear this uh, described as something called Linus's Law. Uh, so in August 2001, which is quite a long time ago, uh, Red Hat published this white paper uh, called, uh, or had the section in it called Strength in Numbers, the Security of Many Eyeballs. And it talks about some of this, uh, this law that, you know, known as many eyeballs theory, it explains what we instinctively know to be true, that an operating system or application will be more secure when you can inspect the code, share it with experts and other members of your user community, identify potential problems, and create fixes quickly. So, what is the, the full, uh, next slide, what is this open source story? Uh, you know, I, I'm not quite taught in school. There's this, you know, nuanced history about how we got to where we are today, where open source is, you know, just on that slide earlier, 80% of the world's public internet infrastructure is built off of an open source operating system and platform. So how did we get to that? Like, we didn't start, that wasn't day one. Uh, so, next slide. So uh, first, by a show of hands, how many of you in the room have heard or seen this quote before? First they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. That's pretty much everyone. Uh, and I was doing research for this talk and apparently, uh, you know, it's often attributed to Mahatma Gandhi, but apparently it's, it, the internet, the verdict is not in on the actual attribution for that quote. So I'm not sure where it actually came from. Uh, but you can conveniently describe the history of the open source movement into this quote. Uh, we're looking at the 1980s, the 1990s, the 2000s, and the 2010s. Next slide. So first, they ignore you. This one. So in 1983, there was the GNU or GNU project. This was essentially the beginning of the free culture movement as it uh, relates to software and technology. So at MIT Media Lab in 1983, there was this guy named Richard Stallman who worked there as a researcher and faculty member. He had lived through this period where there was this, by default, open access to software. Today we're used to, you know, you buy software, you buy a license for software, and that's kind of the, this, the normal way that things work. But back in the 70s and the 80s, people actually didn't really care about software because you had all these different hardware architectures and you know you wrote software for one computer and it wouldn't work on another so people didn't really care about it because you had to do all this extra work to get it to compile on other things so people just shared software like that was the default you know university researchers uh, academics it was that was the default way that people uh, worked and so starting in the 1980s that was when this commercial market shift to software away from hardware it, it, was, it was a major shift that happened in the software industry at the time. And it was uh, it motivated uh, for people like Richard Stallman this belief that software should protect the user and respect their rights and that people should always be able to share these things and, and share software. 
So how does someone like Richard Stallman in 1983 act on this? He decides to build an open source operating system. Not that long after, in 1985, uh, the Free Software Foundation was founded, which was founded in part by Stallman and helped sustain efforts on the GNU operating system. It was also the first notable institution to protect and embrace free software. Uh, it advocated for many parts of the free culture movement beyond just written code only. Next. And then lastly in this chapter is in 1989, we see the GPL, or GNU Public License, that is the version one that's drafted uh, by the Free Software Foundation. It's technically not the very first open source license, but it is the first of its kind. Uh, it introduced this new concept for licenses called copyleft, which if you spend much time in open source, you might see that word get tossed around a lot. Uh, what was so different about it is it marked a significant shift, again, in perspective on how software is developed and how we distribute and share it with other people. The short piece is there, if something is licensed under the GPL or, or any copyleft license, you can't change the terms of the license. If you make changes or modifications, you have to use the same license and distribute it in the same way, just like it was given to you. Next. So now we'll go into the 1990s. We're getting into the next decade here. Then they laugh at you. So in 1991, next one. We have the Linux kernel. How many of you know the Linux kernel and Linux operating systems? It's like about half, three-fourths of the room. So it was one of the earliest open source projects. And it was also an early adopter of the GPL. Because when the GPL was drafted, it was kind of this like, oh, this hippie thing. It was like, you know, we're all trying to make money with software. This isn't really going to go anywhere. But the Linux kernel was like, hey, we're going to try this out. It was a small little project back in 1991. And what ended up happening in the 90s was the Linux kernel development workflow and process ended up shaping a decade of the free culture movement inside of the technology world. Next one. So then in 1997, you know, people start to realize, okay, well maybe there's something to this open source stuff. There's this book that gets mentioned a lot called The Cathedral and the Bazaar. I, I mention it here because I think this is the point when open source starts to go mainstream. Uh, so this was this book written, uh, and it, it kind of describes two different ways of how you can make software, where the cathedral is this proprietary model, and it's very uh, structured, and uh, you know it's very closed, and then the bazaar is this open market where everything is happening all at once, all around you. Um, and the author equated the cathedral to proprietary closed source and bazaar to open source development workflow. Uh, but there was one problem, is that when you talk to business people and you're using the word free, they'll start to look at you, especially in 1990s, and be like, free. Free? So that's where you get to this next one. In 1998, that's where I mentioned earlier the open source definition, the open source initiative. Uh, the OSI, Open Source Initiative, forms in 1998 to basically act as a liaison between the free culture movement and the business world. In many ways, their original mission was almost convincing the business world that free does not mean no bottom line, no revenue. That's not an equivalent. So this is also the point in 1998 where we see the first usages of the term open source software. It emerges at this time. Next slide. So now we sit, get into the 2000s. Then they fight you. OK, so now this open source stuff is kind of going mainstream. They can't ignore it anymore. Uh, and so in the early 2000s, the tides had not yet turned. Open source, it was still this weird, gross thing that businesses and companies didn't want to have much to do with. This next one. So Microsoft, they had no, no secret feelings about how they felt about this at the time. Uh, top executives in Microsoft have famously trashed open source and free software in the early 2000s. Uh, this quote from Jim Alchin, who was like the third top executive at Microsoft at the time, it's like, open source is an intellectual property destroyer. I can't imagine something worse than this for the business. Uh, and uh, it was also, you know, also around this time, there's certain other Microsoft executives who call things like Linux a cancer. You know, there was very strong feelings about open source. But then you win. And suddenly, do the tides ever turn? The 2010s is when open source finally becomes a part of the mainstream accepted narrative. Uh, so first, 
Microsoft announces publicly, like, whoa, they're in love with Linux and open source. Wow, Satya Nadella is leading the charge after Bill Gates yields the throne. We've been in open source for 10 years. We have over 400 projects and 140 working groups dealing with open standards. We love open source. Like, wow, that was just 14 years. Like, a lot, lot changed there. Uh, and it continues to go on, too. You know, Microsoft then drops 7.5 billion U.S. dollars to acquire GitHub. Uh, and at the time, this was one of the largest technology acquisitions at the time. Uh, but then, hold on a little bit, uh, because in 2019, IBM ends up acquiring Red Hat, or my employer, uh, for a whopping 34 billion U.S. dollars. This still remains one of the largest ever technology acquisitions to date. And you can name all the other ones on one hand. One of them includes a little bird. Uh, needless to say, from a capitalist market perspective, open source won. Uh, but now that open source is finally not a controversial thing, uh, and is often expected in many times, what does it actually mean to be open source? So next slide. So here I'm gonna tell you something. I think this is probably one of the most, most helpful or useful things to understand about open source. So when people say open source, you always need to remember these four freedoms of open source or free software. Whenever someone uses an open source license on a software project or even with content or data, they are guaranteeing you four things with that, with that license. Uh, although sometimes how it is guaranteed does vary across licenses, but you should always know is I remember them as the, the, four, the four R's, read, run, revise, redistribute. So reading, you know, the ability to see how something works. You can go and find the source code or find the source and you can study it and, and understand it. Run it. There are no restrictions on how you have to use it. There's no end user license agreement or no, you can't use it for this purpose, only this way. You can use open source software for whatever you want to do with it. Uh, revise or make changes. You are always allowed to make changes to the software. There's nothing that's gonna stop you with an open source project that says, nope, you can't, can't touch this part, this is off limits. If something is, an under, if something is under a legitimate open source license, you can also change it, and you can redistribute or share your changes with other people. So if anyone is ever, uh, you know, when people talk about open source, if you can't do all four of these things, whatever they're tell telling you about or trying to persuade you on, it's not actually open source. So I think these are the, ways that I always you know, try to frame if, if we're talking about open source, this is like the baseline. This is the minimum foundation. So what is the future of working on open source? Uh, so as of 2023, I literally was going last night and pulling some of these numbers. So this is pretty fresh from GitHub's uh, Octoverse report, or kind of the state of GitHub. So in 2023, there are over 100 million developers on GitHub, and of that, 10 million of them are all just from India, actually. Uh, more than 20.5 million joined in 2022 alone, which is larger than the number of people who live in the Netherlands, which is 17 million. And it's just shy of Sri Lanka at 21.5 million. And it's not that far behind Nepal either, around 30 million. So just imagine for a minute like how silly it would be if everyone in the Netherlands became a GitHub developer tomorrow, right? Like it's a lot of people. So there's a lot of developers out there, even if we're just counting one website. Also in, uh, next slide, uh, in 2023 alone, just this year, 98 million repositories that were created. Uh, there's no shortage of projects out there to choose from. Uh, what there is a shortage of is open source projects that provide infrastructure that supports communities around the projects. Uh, so standing out and attracting new contributors to a project is a pretty competitive space. You know, this is just this year, right? Just remember that, just 2023. Uh, and just to give you some numbers, 2019, 44 million, 2021, 61 million, 2022, 85.7 million. There's a lot of repositories out there. And then again, just uh, from last year, get, or this year, I'm sorry, GitHub counted 4.5 billion contributions on the platform. Now, GitHub counts like what is a contribution, or it, they call this commits, issues, pull requests, discussions, gists, pushes, 
and pull request reviews. Uh, so clearly there's a lot happening in this space. Like, again, you can't ignore this anymore. Uh, so finally, let's look at three different spaces where open source is a critical part of building a tech career. I'll share three examples of commercial uses and companies, corporations, in government, and in international NGOs and agencies. So first one, I'll talk a little bit about the commercial side. So earlier I mentioned that the internet wouldn't exist. We would not have an internet without open source. This is also true for several commercial for-profit products that without critical open source building blocks, uh, many commercial products, whether they're open source or not, would simply just, again, not exist. You, it, is, it is everywhere. It is in everything we're using on laptops, on phones, on applications, to all the things I talked about at the beginning, all those examples. Like, it is everywhere. In the case of Red Hat specifically, many of our commercial products are also open source or they're derived from a larger open source upstream project. Or, you know, I, I don't know if, quick show of hands, how many people know like what upstream downstream means? Is that new? Okay, so that's, that's a fewer people. So when we say upstream downstream, what that means is, you know, think of it like a river, it's flowing down. Uh, there's an original project that starts up upstream. It's the original project, you know, work is happening there. And then sometimes people will make a fork of a project or a copy, and then they might be doing their own changes in the downstream. That's not gonna go back upstream, but they can contribute changes back upstream. And oftentimes it's smarter to do that because then you're actually getting to maintain less software on your own. You're working with a community. But when we say upstream, downstream, that's what we mean, is that you know, there's an original project that's kind of uh, maybe is a more general purpose, and then downstream will be like a copy or a fork, or it might have extra features that aren't in the upstream one. There's many different reasons why someone might do that approach. But that's what we're talking about when we say uh, upstream, downstream. So for these three examples I have up here, Red Hat owns these different products, but each of them have uh, diverse communities who participate in making the products better for everyone. We also discussed earlier about how building in the open can be an advantage for innovation and bringing some of the best new ideas to the table. So for all of these, uh, you know, I work with the Fedora project, which is the upstream for Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Fedora does a new release every six months. We're constantly churning out change. Red Hat Enterprise Linux does, I think it's like three or four, year, three year releases, and they're focused much more on stability, like not as much fast paced change. Uh, but that's again, one of the examples. Um, beyond, and you can also find some of these stickers, by the way, we got a little sticker table up here in the front. So if you did not get a chance to grab some of those, do check that out in between the talks today. Uh, but beyond Red Hat and even commercial products, many tech companies also have this thing that's called an open source program office or often called OSPO. Uh, OSPOs grow awareness and investment into open source in the business. Uh, Google, for example, has an OSPO, which runs probably their, one of their best known programs, Google Summer of Code. How many of you know GSOC, Google Summer of Code? That's al almost everyone in the room. Uh, Meta, uh, Facebook also has a very big open source program office, and many Meta engineers actually contribute to projects that are the building blocks for keeping things like Facebook and Instagram online. Uh, but I did mention earlier that uh, I had worked with a team here in Nepal when I was at UNICEF that was building drones with open source hardware schematics. And they were creating affordable drones in a specific Nepalese context for doing last mile delivery in very difficult to reach places. Uh, so the team behind this was called Procura Innovations and their drones connect the hardest to reach places in Nepal to provide those last minute deliveries in a cheap, quick and efficient manner. So common examples of payloads that they're delivering, might be in 2020 when I was working with them, it was all about vaccines at that point, uh, but also medical supplies, blood for blood transfusions. Um, and the reason why open source was a great fit for them, I haven't even talked about open source hardware in this presentation, but you can also find schematics. You know, you wanna build your own drone. Well, here's an open source blueprint and all the parts you need to go and build yourself a drone or do it you know, using local parts instead of buying some $3,000 drone from the United States and, and paying all the Im, uh, import fees and customs to get that here. Well, just make it yourself. Use the things you have available and do it for way cheaper, way more efficiently, and you can scale it much better. 
So that was what this team did. Uh, can you go to the next slide? I don't know if you can try to play this video. This was from uh, their pitch video. So just to give you a preview, this was their, their, when they were applying, I mentioned with the UNICEF Innovation Fund, that was their pitch video when they were applying for funding and got to work with them as they were building out and scaling that product. And I, I thought it was a really great example because it was a really great team to work with and I thought, you know, the open source hardware example that they did was a really great example around that cost, innovation. You were able to do things that, again, you're not having to pay $3,000 for some U.S. drone that you're importing or, or anywhere else in the world really, but uh, I like that example and a very local one as well. Um, next, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, about a government, some government examples. This one's a little bit U.S. specific, but I think it's still useful to understand how even in the U.S. government, open source is a very key part of how infrastructure is built and delivered. So there's this group called 18F, which is part of the United States General Services Administration. And they have an open source policy for when they're building new technology and projects for the U.S. government. Uh, it actually has a comprehensive policy about working and creating open source. Uh, so they uh, develop in-house digital solutions to help government agencies meet the needs of the people and the businesses they serve. This requires flexibility in how they code with a focus on lowering costs for the American people while improving the people's interactions with the U.S. government. The default position of the 18F when they develop new projects is to first use free and open source software, which is a software that does not charge users uh, a purchase or licensing fee for modifying or redistributing the source code, like we talked about earlier, uh, in the projects. And they also contribute back to the open source projects as well. Uh, they develop their work in the open and they publish publicly all source code created or modified by 18F whether that's developed in-house by the government staff or through contracts that they work with contractors for the government. Uh, there's also international NGOs and agencies. I mean, I've been talking a little bit about UNICEF up here, which is probably the, the better example here. Another team that I got to work with uh, was this project called Seaboard. Seaboard is a, uh, an AAC, augmentative, uh, augmentative and alternative communication tool. So if you say you have a, a child or even an adult who has a speech disability, not able to speak or, or has a hard time doing that, Seaboard is a project, actually we can go to the next slide. Uh, it's a project that provides a, an interface for kids using pictures and images to build sentences and communicate uh, 
you know, to, an, to their parents or to other people about, you know, what they're trying to say. Um, and this was, again, an open source project I worked with. The founder was from Argentina. He had um, ALS, so he was, it was a very personal project for him as well because he also had this challenge. Like he, you know, over his life, was it, he lost his ability to speak and he became paralyzed. And Seaboard was also, for him, a way that he was able to use it and communicate with others. And by creating it as an open source project and working with UNICEF to scale that, he was able to help the lives of so many other people around the world in doing that. Do the next slide. Play just a few minutes of this video. Ona je u jednom momentu bila uznemirena i ja sam dodala taj komunikator i pitala sam joj šta želiš i ona je meni kliknula da jede srna do tada i da mi je došla. To su jako velike stvari. Ona je u jednom momentu bila uznemirena i ja sam dodala taj komunikator i pitala sam joj šta želiš i ona je meni kliknula da jede srna. Kada ona uspe da ispolji bilo koju emociju, prvo što više Mnogo malo imamo tih momenta da je kada ona vrišti i kada je nervozna jer ne zna da ispoli nešto što hoće da kaže. Ali drugo, ta sreća da ona uspe nešto da kaže. Kada ona uspe da ispoli bilo koje emocije, prvo što više, mnogo malo imamo tih momenta kada ona vrišti i kada je nervozna jer ne zna da ispoli nešto što hoće da kaže. Uzme i klikne, na primjer, baš na primjer, hoćemo da se igramo te igre, hoćemo da se igramo sa tim igračom, ima fantastično. Again, just another example, again, it was all an open source tool, and I, I love that example because uh, it really, you could see the impact on working with children and, and even adults, again, people of all ages that were able to use this tool, and because it was built in an open source way, you know, the project was developed in Argentina, built for specific use cases for people in South America, and this was someone in Serbia who was also using the tool where UNICEF helped uh, grow, deploy, and scale the tool for people to use there as well. So finally, the last thing before I wrap up for today is how can this actually all, everything I just talked about, how does this connect into your career? So I've got three, three tips, three, three suggestions for you as you go through the conference to keep these three things in mind. First, again, know what people really mean when they say open source. It's, it's pretty much a buzzword these days. You know, again, they, uh, the transition from the last 40 years there's been a huge change now. It's, again, open source is not going anywhere. It's, it's here to stay. So people use the word a lot. So you should know what open source really means. And that is whether someone's talking about software, content, data, or even hardware, like we saw with the drones. Uh, does their definition of open source include these four, these four freedoms, these four R's? Again, that's always your basic litmus, litmus test for whether anything is actually open source or not. If it's missing even just one of these things, whatever it is, it might be open, but it's not open source. Uh, second, uh, okay, next slide. Open source is a great way to grow and launch your career. Again, open source is everywhere. Participating in open source projects and communities can help you apply new skills that you're learning you can network with other industry professionals, and you can build connections that can even lead to a big break. Either that's for a first tech job or pivoting your career in a new direction. It's like I said, for me, I was a volunteer working in the Fedora project for a long time, and then, well, now here I am working at Red Hat, going doing Fedora as part of my, my full-time role and the things that I do in my job every day. So, you know, Take advantage of that as a way that you can also, even if you're not necessarily getting paid for an open source project, it can help level you up to a point where you can gain new skills, meet people and connect with people who you might not normally get to otherwise. It's a great way to network, grow your skills, and get some real world experience without having to get a salary or, or get, go through the whole job process. You know, no one's gonna require you to have a diploma even to start contributing to an open source project. And lastly, get to know, even just here, some of your fellow attendees, speakers, even the organizers. 
Uh, these events are so important for networking and getting to know others, and you can even learn something new. All the great speakers and content that are going to be happening all week. So there's a lot of knowledge that's even just here right now in this room. Think about how to go from being a passive to an active attendee so that you leave the event with more than you had coming into this. And I really cannot overemphasize the importance of networking and getting to know others. For example, like if I hadn't gotten to know Christy and some of the other GNOME organizers here, I probably wouldn't have had the privilege of coming up here and getting to talk to you all today about these things. So that's my presentation for today. Thank you all for, for listening. You can find me at any of these places here on, the, on social media, on Mastodon, Twitter, GitLab, or Matrix. You can also find my slides. I'll make sure these get uploaded to the GNOME uh, schedule website, so you can find them in the Indico site in a little bit. But you can also find them all online. There's a link if you could be able to catch any of the slides, but I'll make sure that they get distributed and shared. Thank you all for your time. I don't know, do we have any time for questions? Or I, I know we're probably running a little behind today. Okay, we got a little time for questions. Does anyone have any questions or things to ask or comment before we wrap up? It's a lot of information all at once. <laughs> you were really clear, probably. <laughs> So if you have any questions, raise your hands and I'll be right there with the microphone. Don't be shy. Justin is here today, tomorrow. You have the chance now. Yep, and even if you think of something later, just come up to me. Say hi. Uh, I'd love to get to talk to some of you folks and, and get to know you better too. So I'll be here again for the whole conference. Thank you all so much. Enjoy GNOME Asia, and I will see you around the conference. <laughs>One last thing, I wanted to give a plug that after the event ends today, we are having a Fedora 20th anniversary and release party today. So it'll be a little bit in the evening. We have some cake and other things to snack on, so do check it out. We'll have some time to, again, network and, and socialize and connect, and we'll also be hearing from, we have several different folks from the Fedora community who are also here right now that you'll get to hear from and get a wider view of what all these things we do in Fedora are. So do check out the release party at the end of today. We'd love to see you all there. Come and join us and have some cake. It, I believe it's in the venue. Yeah, it is, it's going to be here. So you don't have to go anywhere. We'll be right here, and we'll have some delicious uh, Fedora 20th anniversary cake. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mr. Flory, for your inspiring and enlightening session. A round of applause for Mr. Flurry again. Now we are going to continue with the parallel sessions. Mr. Federico is going to have his session in this hall, and Mr. Matthias is going to have his session on lecture room 14, track 2. We'd like to request you to move accordingly.
I'd like to invite Mr. Federico Mena and Ms. Roseanne Yuan for their presentation. Everyone, Federico's busy taking a photo of all of y'all, so say hi. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so I'm Rosanna Yoon, that's Federico Mena, and we're here to talk to you about uh, GNOME's Konoka Nut. Um, next, do we have the next slide? Do I do it here? Okay. So um, I want to, before we get started, um, this is the information that we want everyone to leave here with. Uh, if you see a code of conduct violation and you want to report it, this is how you do it. Uh, if you're in person at an event, you can come to one of the incident responders. Here it's Federico, me, and Anissa, who's right there. Uh, we're all wearing um, scarves and, and these yellow lanyards. If you can't find us, uh, the organizers should be able to help you find us. Um, you can also report online. Uh, websites conduct.gnome.org, easy to remember. Uh, and it, if you don't uh, want to send it to the entire committee, uh, you can go to the, our um, wiki page that's on the bottom. It'll give you instructions and our individual email addresses in case you want to uh, email any one of us individually. So yes, it's nice to meet you. Hello, uh, come on in. Um, a quick introduction to me. Uh, I've been running GNOME since the pre 1.0 days. Uh, for anyone who's counting, uh, that's from 1998. Uh, I was the first uh, female to submit code into GNOME. I worked on a little uh, solitaire game called IlleWrite. You might have used it. Uh, I helped write the games in it. I helped with documentation. Uh, translations, all that jazz. I even made the terrible set of cards when I learned that I'm a terrible graphic designer. Um, so yeah, I've been in the GNOME community since 98. Uh, uh, in 2006, I was hired by the foundation to help temporarily uh, with various things uh, because we just lost our executive director, so I was there to help maintain things and keep things going, and this was a temporary job, and it's, what, 2006 till now, I'm still here. Um, so I've been to many uh, GNOME conferences and events, and I've seen many folks come and go. Um, that's the nature of free software, right? Ooh, what did I just do? I just killed my slides. Um, so how am I still here? Um, I am here because I was uh, super lucky. Sorry, I'm just trying to find my speaker notes again. Um, give me a second. Uh, speaker notes, there we go. Yes, so when I first started, I mentioned I um, started contributing with a solitaire game. Um, that was established with my uh, boyfriend at the time. He helped me uh, set it up, and he uh, worked on the desktop team at Red Hat, which is now run by Matthias, who's in the talk in the other room. Um, but my husband at the time was helped me, um, and his team helped protect me and mentor me and taught me all the things I needed to know. Um, Federico was part of that team. Uh, there are also lots of amazing people that were on that team as well. Um, Federico can probably talk, talk about them later. But uh, these awesome folks helped protect me. Uh, they probably didn't see it that way, and if you talk to them about it, like when I told Federico about this, he was like, wait, what? <laughs> I didn't do that, but yes, he did. Um, there were people I trusted. They like would tell me about people I should avoid, right? They would say, you don't want to talk to this person, you know, just come over here and, and we'll make sure you're, you're safe at this event. Sorry. Um, so, they were uh, 
like if, if anyone ever came up to me and started making me feel uncomfortable, I knew I had people I could go to to help me, right? I could like, and just standing by them would often keep these people from asking me the questions that were making me uncomfortable. So even so, like I started drifting out in like the early 2000s. I mean, I did a software or a card game, right? It's like not all that awesome. Um, I mentioned these people that I was working or hung out with, like Federico. They're all rock stars. Like, you know, they they created, amongst other things, like the toolkit and and all these other things. And I felt like my contributions weren't all that great. Um, and yes, that's imposter syndrome right there. And if I went back to saw someone. Um, now, doing anything of the things I was doing back then, I would probably, first thing I would do, make sure they're a foundation member, and if not, I'd help them become one, because th th that's the type of person we want in our community, right? But I was, like, so I drifted out. I, I mean, I was still peripheral. I didn't help with coding, um, but I would, uh, I would write mag uh, articles for Red Hat Magazine. I worked on a book on GNOME. Uh, I did lots of bug reporting. I did a lot of that. Um, but, you know, not, not like I didn't attend any conferences for a few years. Um, and then in 2006, as I mentioned before, uh, the executive director left. Um, the foundation needed someone to help, uh, help out. And the, the executive director had left from in Boston, so his office stuff was still there. And I was there. I was in Boston at the time. Uh, and I was also not working at the time because I was pregnant and waiting for my first baby. So I figured I'd help out temporarily. I'd go through the box of papers, help make sure um, all the people were invoiced, get our money, get our paperwork done. Um, so I got hired, and I've been there ever since. Uh, what, 17 years now? <laughs> Something like that? Yeah. So temporary. Temporary doesn't always mean short term. <laughs> so yeah. Um, Federico, do you want to talk about how you got into GNOME? So, hi, my name is Federico Mena. I'm one of the founders of GNOME. Uh, a friend of mine from university, Miguel de Casa, and I started GNOME back when we were in college in 2000, in, sorry, before that, 90, 90, 96. We started in 96, 97. We started in 96 and announced the project in 97, and it's been rolling along ever since. Uh, these are two really old pictures. The first picture on the left is from the first GNOME conference called GUADEC. It was the GNOME Users and Developers European Conference because the idea back then was that conferences would rotate among countries in Europe and we were sort of hoping that other people would uh, take up the task of doing conferences in other places. So now fortunately we have GNOME Asia which has been rotating among, among countries in this side of the world and it's fantastic. And we are just starting to do the same thing in Latin America. Uh, and, yeah, that's right there. Uh, this was most of the GNOME developers back there. then. Uh, where are you, Rosanna? I, I was out to dinner with my husband at the time because we were in Paris. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> this, this was the, we had a party in a boat. Uh, there's a river that runs through Paris and there was a little boat there, a little boat, like uh, not a huge ship, just a little boat, and it was small enough that it could, it, hold, it could hold a party for the attendees of the conference, and that was that. But Rosanna and, and her husband, Jonathan, the authors of the original GNOME Solitaire game, they decided, no, 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 we don't want to be with the cool kids. We're going to have a nice dinner in Paris instead. <laughs> so that's what they did. Uh, that was good because uh, another group of us who went to another restaurant later, they got uh, really, really bad food poisoning from some fish or something. Anyway, and that other picture, the one on the right, is from uh, 2008. That's another boat party. Boat parties seem to be a theme, a recurring theme in, in GNOME conferences. Uh, that's another boat party, and we are having the ice cream death match. The idea is to see who can finish a whole tub of ice cream first. first. It's a liter of ice cream. It it's down. a lot of fun. Yeah. So anyway. Uh, this is, wh wh where am I, wh wh why am I telling this to you? Uh, we have had many people come and go in GNOME, 
And the ones that uh, come into the project, they are great. But we don't always get to hear why some people leave the project. You know, sometimes their life changes for them. They finish their degrees in college. They get a real job. Sometimes they get married and no longer have time to work on the project. Uh, but sometimes they leave because they are not comfortable in the project anymore. And we very seldom hear about them. Did someone make them uncomfortable? Did someone harass them out of the project? So. Back in the back in 2010, more or less, the Geek Feminism Project started compiling a list of incidents of harassment that happened during conferences. And, so, and you can look at the list online; it's full of horrible stuff. You know, people uh, harassing women, being uh, being just uh, terrible. And they started compiling a list of these cases, and this started making it. Uh, more well known that we needed to do something about about that to to basically avoid uh, driving people out of projects just because of uh, sexism, homophobia, harassment, or even um, microaggressions, or, or even microaggressions. Yeah. You know, like uh, you know, uh, ignoring the women in the room because the men are present, or thinking that uh, if you see a woman in the developer conference. She must be the partner of somebody there, not an actual developer. So we want to avoid that yeah, kind of thing. I mean, like uh, one of the last th ones I went to for a long, one of the last events I went to for a long time was in 2003 in, in uh, Dublin, which was Guadalc. Uh And it was great. I mean, I saw a lot of people and it's a great city, but there were enough microaggressions and I felt uncomfortable enough um, that I stopped going to go events for a while and I just sort of did my own thing. and. Uh, if it weren't for you know my husband and all y'all awesome folks, I would never have come back. So there we go. So yeah, the um, this is our mission statement. Uh, the GNOME Foundation is a nonprofit organization that believes in a world where everyone is empowered by technology they can trust. Okay, the key word here is everyone. Everyone needs to be empowered. Um, and we can't build this world unless everyone is in the room, right? Uh, if, unless we have as diverse ba uh, base of users and developers as possible, we just don't know how to uh, uh, get the help them feel comfortable in the room or produce the software that they can use, right? I mean, um, I'm, my son is left-handed, right? And there are things that I do to make sure that like he's comfortable doing things like We've gotten him left-handed scissors, things like that. But even so, there are things that, you know, he will come to me and say, hey, it would be so much easier if we could do this this other way. And, you know, it makes a lot of sense, but it would not, it never have occurred to me because that's not my life experience. So you need to have people in the room with the life experience as diverse as possible in order to be able to create the software for everyone that we want to do. So, the reason we have a code of conduct is we want to make the whole creating a diverse and community that everyone feels welcome in to be less about luck and more about intention, right? We want people to know that they're welcome. Um, so if a few years ago, uh, a bunch of us were feeling like this was a very important thing for our community and so we got together and created uh, we uh, our code of conduct, we got a, uh, consultant to come help us create one using current or best practices at the time. Um, note that like these things have um, evolve over time. So, you know, it, this is something we're going to have to keep looking at and refining as we go. Um, we do this to try and level the playing field so that when more people are feel welcome and comfortable, they will stay and uh, the code of conduct is created so that we can make it happen. Uh, one of the important things about the code of conduct is, th is that it's very specific in spelling out what the scope of the code of conduct is. I mean, if you are in a GNOME conference like this one, 
you are covered by the code of, code of conduct. You are protected by it, and we expect you to abide by its yeah. rules. You know, everyone should have read it before they showed up today, right? Yeah. If you haven't read it yet, uh, go to the website uh, there. during the day. It, it's there. It says, uh, and and the scope of the code of conduct it mentions uh, conferences, online spaces, the bug tracking system, the mailing lists. And the reason for having such a specific scope is so that people cannot try to skirt around the rules. We, there have been cases in free software conferences where some asshole harasses a woman in the conference, but does it in a hallway, not in a conference room or in a staircase, you know? And once they get reprimanded, they will start trying to talk their to talk their way out of the thing. Oh, but it was not in the conference room, so how can you know that they are telling the truth? Well, you are within the conference space, and the scope of the code of conduct includes, you know, hallways, staircases, uh, meeting areas, uh, social lunch, events. social events, lunch areas, things like that. Uh, the scope of the code of conduct also mentions uh, who, who gets, who needs to abide by the code of conduct and, and who is covered? You know, uh, basically all participants in the project. If you participate in online discussions, if you attend a conference, if you are a vendor attending a conference just to have a stand with things you give away, you need to abide by the code of conduct. There's no exceptions for them. The board members of the GNOME Foundation board need to abide by the code of conduct. The executive director, Everyone who participates in the project has to has to comply with the with the co with the code of conduct so that there's no exceptions. Um, and we in in the code of conduct document, which you can read online, uh, we set some expectations for what is acceptable. You know, and these are just. Um, suggestions on how to behave. We cannot control people's behavior. At most, we can give them a list of things we sort of expect them to do, and, a li and, an, and an explicit list of things that we definitely don't want them to do. So these are the community guidelines. These are the things we expect people, uh, you know, be friendly, be empathetic, try to consider other people's viewpoints when talking to them. If someone comes in very angry reporting a bug, don't say, no, you're crazy, this must, not, this must not be happening. Rather, consider their situation. Why did they take the trouble to report the thing? Be respectful at all times, even if you're having a bad day. Try to recognize when you're having a bad day, and maybe, you know, don't comment until later when you're better, things like that. You want to do the inappropriate? Or? Sure. So um, the, the list we saw earlier, the, the community guidelines, they're, they're great, they're guidelines, they're not a meter stick that we can really measure infractions against, right? They're suggestions, they're what we want people to do, but you can't like tell people they have to be nicer as opposed to like ambivalent, right? Um, this, however, is a list of behaviors we definitely would act against, right? This is, um, these are, Rule breaking, these are ones that we will uh, definitely ha act as a committee to keep from happening within our community. Um, the code of conduct does e elaborate on this these points. I did edit them a little bit to get them to fit on the screen. So if any of this is at all confusing, please go to our uh, code of conduct and read it more carefully. Um, And uh, yeah, so this is so that people feel comfortable, obviously, in the community. Um, and <laughs> safety versus comfort. This is uh, always the most controversial part of our uh, code of conduct. Um, it, it should be pretty obvious, right? Someone being safe is more important than someone else just being comfortable. Uh, However, we always hear people complain. It's like, but but that's the way things have always been, uh, or you know, it's never bothered anyone before. 
I've never heard anyone complain. Uh, but that, that's not a good excuse, right? If someone isn't feeling safe, they may not feel safe enough to tell you. Uh, so if someone tells you that their, their safety is being compromised, if they come to the, our committee and say that they need help to feel safe, we will do our best to help them feel safe. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So why should I trust the Code of Conduct Committee? Uh, why should you trust the Code of Conduct Committee? Uh, you can meet us in person or online. The in-person members of the committee that are at this conference are the three of us. There is Anissa right there, Rosanna, and myself. There is another member, Michael Downey, who unfortunately was not able to attend the conference. And I guess the thing that we share among us is that we have all gotten training, actual training to know how to deal with, uh, in, with people who, who report incidents uh, against the code of conduct. So we are not just, uh, let's say, the group of nice people who want to help you. We have actually gotten training on how to do that, how to take reports while keeping people's confidentiality, uh, how to take reports while making the, the people making the reports uh, safe and comfortable. You know, if you, if you want to make a report in person to us during the conference, uh, we will take you to a safe space where we're not bothered by anyone else and we can discuss, discuss things in private. We are careful to, to keep uh, personal information confidential about reports because we don't want, we don't want you know, false rumors to spread around. Uh, we just want to deal with the thing and, and keep, keep people safe. Um, Reports are anonymous. We don't release the name of the people who reported the case so that they don't get harassed later. And um, Yeah, if you're in a situation where you are afraid to report because uh, it, it was a one-on-one -on -one situation and you know that if you reported it and something happened that the perpetrator would know it was you, uh, we strongly suggest you report it anyway, but let us know. Uh, we will not act upon it, but we will sit on it uh, because people tend to act according to their behavior. So chances are good that it will happen again to someone else, right? So if we get multiple reports against a person, we can s anonymize it so that they may not, it, it would be harder for them to know who reported it. Uh, we want, as, as we say, uh, safety is our paramount concern here. So if you don't feel safe, let us know and we will make sure that anything we do uh, we, we try and keep your safety top in our minds. Yeah, one of the other important things when we mentioned that there are no exceptions to the people that are uh, expected to abide by the code of conduct is that if, for example, if you wanted to report a person from the code of conduct committee who did something bad to you, we have a procedure for that. So you go to someone else on the committee and they will know what to do. They will basically keep your your case anonymous and not inform the other person in the committee who is being reported. So we have, uh, we have, we know how to handle that. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about the easy cases in the we have handled in the code of conduct committee and the hard cases. And the, the easy cases, paradox paradoxically, are the ugly ones. You know, if we find a person who consistently makes sexist comments online, we just kick them out of the project. It's not a problem to kick them out. And it's easy and it's done. You know, if uh, someone uh, is being racist in the bug tracker, we have had cases about that, we just kick them out. No discussion. Uh, the idea is to keep the, the affected people uh, safe, you know? But the hard cases are the ones that are not uh, violating one of the things that are forbidden by the code of conduct. But for example, someone who is uh, hard to work with, not because they are jerks or harassers or anything, but they're just, just you know, abrasive, hard to work with. They always want to get their way in the discussion. 
uh, or people who have a very closed mind in, t in the terms of how things should work or, or how they should be technically resolved. Those are harder because when, when, we, get pe when, we, get, when we get reports uh, referring to those people, you know, they haven't done anything that is forbidden by the code of conduct, but they are just being difficult. And, you know, we're not people's parents to tell them, hey, you should be nicer to your peers in your work group, or uh, you should uh, think about the things you say so that people don't consider you as abrasive and such. So those are harder. I mean, we are happy to help you resolve uh, differences of opinion between yourselves and, and some other uh, part of the project, but, uh, you know, we cannot teach people how to behave like children and you know we, we we can just help people get along with each other we're not etiquette experts unfortunately yeah <laughs> you want to do this one uh yeah i can do that uh one thing we have uh seen in the project is that i mean rosanna and i have been in gnome for 20 for over 25 years you know between the both of us we have over 50 years of combined uh, experience we are that old yes. um, and one thing that happens in projects that go on for so long is that the community evolves the project changes direction the code of conduct changes because it has to evolve with the times, you know. The first, the very first code of conduct we had in GNOME back in 2005, more or less, it was very, very short. It was essentially uh, just the community guidelines, be friendly, be empathetic, be respectful, you it's, know. It's what I call the Bill and Ted's rule, like be excellent to each other. Yeah, these are the be excellent to each other rules, and they are nice. They are nice to keep in mind, but you cannot enforce them. You know, if someone is doing a sexism or doing a racism, those rules are not contemplated. We need we need a we need a better conduct, code of conduct, and we went through a whole process to to get one. We got uh, we hired a consultant to help us write it. There's consultancies these days to help you write a code of conduct for your community or for your project. That, that, that did not exist back then. That did not exist in, in the early 2000s. So we are very fortunate that now we can use these resources to, to help uh, keep people safe. People change, people evolve, you know? Sometimes, uh, and sometimes people change or the project changes or the community changes in a way that is not compatible with each other, you know, if, uh, you know, I have a lot of founders privilege, I'm one of the founders of the project, I'm, and I'm still here, which means that for me, I have had a good enough time being in the project that there's no reason for me to leave. Rosanna has a different experience, as she already mentioned, and, uh, but sometimes people find themselves in the uncomfortable position that they think the project should be run one way, but the project is running itself another way, and neither of those is wrong, you know? They just had different expectations or the community moved in a different direction than they expected. And at that time, the best thing the project and that, that person can do is just accept that fact and maybe take a break for a while from the project. Or maybe accept, okay, you know, the, I, I had fun, some fun in the project for a while, but it's no longer for me. Maybe they are taking different technical decisions than I wanted, I will look in another place, or maybe they have different values than I do now. You know, maybe they they, they need to look in another another place. Uh, what we are trying to do with the code of conduct is to keep it up with the times. You know, we have different views on what's appropriate behavior than what people had back in 2000, 2005. So, if someone is still stuck in this era and it's not compatible with the current thinking, well, that's too bad, you know? Maybe they need to look elsewhere or make their own project. And I mean, it's fine for people to leave the project, just make it, make, just make it a conscious decision, you know? So this is back to the beginning slide again. Um, just as a reminder, this is how 
if you, anything happens that you feel is a code of conduct or violation, this is how you would report the incident. Um, there's also uh, the URL at the bottom is where you find uh, access to each of our email addresses if you want to report it privately. Um, that's really, I think, all we have for you today. Uh, is there any questions? Thank you. So you are mentioned about code of conduct majority of the time and a lot of things uh, pretty much uh, in line with that. So are you taking special care of diversity by any chance? By encouraging people, uh, you know, from various like uh, women uh, into the community, are you taking any initiatives on that part, especially diversity is my question. The Kadoom Foundation does have a uh, diversity a working group that just started up again. Our next meeting is next Monday on the 11th. On the 11th, um, I'm also on that committee. I do a lot for Kadoom, um, so I'm on that committee. Uh, we would love to have you there as well um, if you're interested. Uh, I obviously. Um, would be happy to have the, the uh, diversity committee and the Kodakata committee work together. Uh, there's ideally like there's lots of education that we could do and workshops we could do combined that would work be great for our community. Um, but like I said, it's it's starting up again. So um, as a group, we're looking at ideas and what we want to do and what we can do. Um, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Federico, and uh, another speaker uh, for the very insightful. Um, uh, sorry for <laughs> I could not get your name. Um, it was very insightful uh, talk on the code of conduct and being as a founder of uh, any uh, nonprofit, it's it's really important to know. Uh, I would like to know: uh, Do you have any like uh, LGBTQ uh, community uh, contributors and? If you have, uh, do you have like uh, any kind of you know, uh, difference in the code of conduct or, or any like uh, different behaviors from the general audience? Uh, we do have LGBTQ people. I'm one myself, I'm bi. Uh, we don't out other people here, so I cannot mention them by name, but uh, they're out there in the project. Uh, the the Code of Conduct mentions LGBTQ people as a, one of the protected classes. Uh, so if, if you look at the actual Code of Conduct document, you'll see the list of protected classes. We have, uh, you know, uh, people, uh, uh, LGBTQ people, uh, we don't discriminate based on age, uh, race, skin color, uh, religion, case, um, it's a long list. veteran status. It's, it's a very long list of protected. Uh, Actually, classes. I'm curious to know about the like how many like challenges you face when uh, you have the other attendees and you know those community uh, attendees. So like, do, did you anyone reported like they have like uh, get some discrimination, something like that? Can you? I'm just like uh, curious to know like uh, like. We have other m more numbers in the you know other com uh, like general um, contributors and very less in the LGBT side. So, did you f get any reports like uh, any sort of incidents? So, um, good news, bad news. Uh, the good news is we have not gotten any incident reports uh, under these topics. The bad news is that doesn't mean they don't happen. Um, one of the things that I, one of the reasons we're doing this talk here today is because we want people to realize that they should report incidents if they were to happen. Uh, how getting zero reports is not necessarily a good thing. It may mean people just aren't comfortable telling us. Um, and, you know, I can see that, right? Like, I could see back then, even if there had been a code of conduct, I might not have reported the incident, but knowing that a code of conduct was there was enough, would have been enough for me to realize that I wasn't in the wrong. Uh, 
Um, and hopefully that's helpful for some people, but we do want people to report if there are incidents because we can't do anything unless we know about them. Um, I'm happy that there are more people who are aware now, uh, and if, like, if there are any incidents, we really, really do want to hear about it. So please do let us know. Uh, and uh, we are working on our current transparency report. Um, Anissa and I are actually have a meeting later today to hash that out. And uh, we are aiming to have transparency reports released regularly so people can see how, uh, how many reports are sent through our committee. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, one, one thing about the transparency reports we release is that uh, we have to anonymize them. We cannot say, oh, we had this person report this one, <laughs> right? So we have to anonymize them. Uh, oh, we're out of time, okay. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, both of us will be around for the rest of the conference. Um, feel free to come up and say hi. We'd love to talk. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Federico and Ms. Rosanna, for such an informative session. Uh, let's wait for the session in the next hall to come to an end.
invite Mr. Aryan Kaushik for his presentation. Uh, so hello everyone. My presentation is on GNOME extensions, the key to more users and developers. So before we start, how many of you have at least heard of GNOME extensions on Linux? Okay, that's cool. So a little bit about me. I'm Arun Kaushik, and by the way, yes, that's me. Before I forgot how to use a trimmer, and that's why I say read documentation. Uh, I am a GNOME Foundation member. Maintainer of Logo Menu, a GNOME extension which has about 110,000 downloads as of today. Uh, I am the group lead at GNOME Users Group, Delhi and Sierra region. I was a Google Summer of Code 2023 intern at Google Chromium and was also a Google Summer of Code 2022 intern at GNOME Foundation where I worked on the PTP project which is a video editor using GStreamer and Python. I was an ex-board of director member at LBRY Foundation and I'm also creating the Ubuntu India local community as of now. So to start with, what are GNOME extensions? GNOME extensions are simply small pieces of code which are written in GJS, where GJS stands for GNOME JavaScript, and they modify your shell to add certain features or modify the way GNOME works. They become the part of the core operating system and that's why they have to have the same license as the GNOME shell as Jen Peterson said in the first talk about all the licensing and what is open source etc. So that's to comply, uh, comply with that. And usually it has to modify the GNOME shell. Uh, it can go by without it but we say it has to modify because then only it makes sense to make it as an extension otherwise you can just package it as an application instead. So why do people use it? They use it to add features which are not by default added in the GNOME shell. And there are a lot of features which uh, you might need but others might not. You might have certain criteria for what is productive for you which is not uh, aligned with my, my with the GNOME philosophy. So that is why we use them. So an example can be I have a small extension which uh, shows the CPU usage, RAM usage and temperature on my laptop because I just kill it every day and I also have a small extension which shows a cat on the top bar and it runs with the speed of my CPU so if I am stressing it at 100% it just becomes a marathon racer. Now that might be cool to have in the GNOME shell but I don't think many people want a cat running on their laptop. So that is, that is why we use the GNOME shell, uh, extensions to modify the shell according to us and have the features we want without really modifying the core base of the GNOME shell. So the community around them. There are tons of tons of developers around uh, GNOME extensions and they are available on the GNOME extensions metrics channel where we follow the GNOME code of conduct and uh, it is a great community where we talk a lot, we uh, share ideas, we solve code and that is a great community if you want to join that. There are about 406 uh, GNOME extensions which supports GNOME 45 and about 550 which supports 44 and below. So there are tons of extensions to choose from for all the needs you want and about 72 lakh downloads are the highest one on the most used extension out there which is dash to doc. A lot of people might have heard about that. What is the benefit as developers? Because a lot of people over here we are developers and we write code and this is how I started my journey into open source. I started creating an extension and that led me to become a GNOME developer and I then started contributing to the GNOME shell, a Pitvi project and other GNOME projects. So it was a beginning point for me as well. And the reason for that is it gives you practical experience with GTK which is GNOME toolkit. We use mostly the same libraries like GIO and uh, GNOME uh, libraries and with this you just get to know the community a lot. A uh, few days ago, Fractal 5 was launched and I was reading the post and a lot of people were complaining, okay, this should have been this license, this uh, should have been packaged like this or that. With GNOME extensions, it's just a zip file. So it just gives you a great breakthrough into the process without having all that messy things of learning uh, how to package things, uh, what packaging format I should follow, how sh I should do that. So it's a great breaking point for that. It makes you learn the GNOME way that how GNOME commits uh, are done, how should I interact with the community, uh, what things I should follow 
without really having the hectic of uh, a large code base because again GNOME shell extensions are very small in size and it makes you support features without implementing in the core shell. So if I, again, the example of the running cat, if I want that, I don't have to ping GNOME developers and say, okay, I want a cat on my laptop or I want the CPU monitor on the top bar. I don't have to change that GNOME thinking. I can just Im include that without having to go through all that. Now, what is the benefit to GNOME in this? First of all, we get more developers. Again, the example of me, I got into GNOME because of GNOME extensions. I became a developer for the applications because of these only. It gets more user conversion, which we will talk more about later. And it can have an ecosystem tailored for all. How many of you customize your desktop environment when you first get it, like Linux, Android, Windows, any operating system, anything you use? So, yeah. So everyone wants to have a custom thing. Like it's not one size fits all. Not everyone can have the same size t-shirt. Not everyone can have the same environment. It just is not one thing which is productive for other might not be for you. So that is why uh, it gets more user conversion and gets some uh, ecosystem which is tailored for all. GNOME doesn't have to include everything and every setting and include hundreds and thousands of settings to turn one thing on, turn other thing off. They can just have the functionality for extensions and does it for you. And it is best of the both world. GNOME by default is very minimalistic, which is great for a lot of purposes, but when you want some other things, when you want some customizations, you can use extensions instead. So it just saves the headache of GNOME core team to deal with all those issues. Okay. So benefit as feature review. So a few days ago, a uh, few months ago actually, I was at Guadec and there they showed us that how they used GNOME extensions as a way to uh, launch the new activities toggle. They used it to get feedback that how the toggle should look like, uh, how the, uh, it should interact with the people, how it should interact with the operating system. And it was just great. I just saw, uh, saw the GitLab issue and there were tons and tons of developers sharing their feedback. So GNOME can use it as a feature review as well that, okay, we are launching this feature, you can check it out, you can share your feedback and we'll implement it, we will change it, and so that we have the best feature at the time of launch. And it can also serve as an insight into what the community wants. If, a communi if community members are using one extension a lot, then it can serve as a feedback that, okay, they, it is doing something which, is, which might be lacking in the GNOME shell and it might make more sense to be a part of the shell itself instead of being a, as an extension because extensions break, extensions have other issues with them. And it can also serve as a proof of what they don't like in GNOME shell, like what they modify the most to have a functionality back or change a functionality. The benefit is user conversion. Again, it attracts a lot of people because you can customize it. I use GNOME because it is simple at first and then I can add extensions which I want instead of turning things off. I want to add things instead of removing them, which is more convenient, more faster, and more efficient for everyone. It gives a personal experience to all. We all can have a personal experience. We don't have to uh, have the same environment as everyone else, and there's a story behind it. I use my laptop a lot in public places in my class because whenever someone sees me using GNOME with my extensions on, they just get attracted to it and say, okay, what operating system are you using? What shell are you using? And I just say, okay, I'm using GNOME, it's Linux, and you should try it. So they get in because of the customizations, because of the UI, because of the appearance, and then they stick, it, stick with it for the open source culture and the community we have around it. It helps you implement things which might not align with GNOME otherwise. There are certain things like tray icons, which GNOME uh, said that we don't want tray icons, but some people wanted them, so they made an extension for it. And some, it, some people wanted vertical uh, scroll on GNOME, which was not present there. So it gives you the power to have what you want without modifying uh, the GNOME way or going against that. So quick stats. In 2022, GNOME conducted a survey uh, using the GNOME Info Collect tool, where uh, it was learned that 83% of the participants used certain extension. At least one extension was present on their system. 40% had between one and five, 60% had about five or less, and 25% had between six and 10. Now the survey size was small, there were not many people, the sample size was small, still, it can still 
show us that there are a lot of people who use extensions on a daily basis and it is empowering their experience with GNOME. And this is more detailed stats and I think I fall in the 6 to 10 or 11 to 18 uh, criteria, I have to count again, but this is just how many extensions I use to customize GNOME to my personal preferences. It might not be just because of workflow or other things, it might just be because it makes it more what I love, how I want it to look like, and things like that. These were some of the most famous extension supports. App Indicator support, I used to use that, but not anymore. GS Connect, I use it every day, and I think it's one of the best extensions out there, so thanks developers for that. User theming, if you want to apply themes, and dash to dock and panel, which also I used to use, and this is the most downloaded extension out there with 72 lakh downloads. There was also one more survey, which was done by Canonical. Uh, it was done in 2017, based on GNOME extensions only. So GNOME Info Collect was more of a general survey on the whole GNOME experience, where extensions was a part of it, but this was just for GNOME extensions itself, where they got 18,330 responses, and this showcases that a lot of people are advocating for extensions even back then. So what can GNOME do to help in this regard? First of all, has have less breakage of extensions. Now I know that whenever we upgrade the code, there will be breakages, there will be issues, it will cause problems, but it just breaks a lot when we upgrade GNOME and it just takes a toll on the developers to maintain the extension. For example, my extension supported GNOME 44 and when 45 got launched, we got a new JavaScript module and things like that, which broke my extension. I didn't get time to upgrade it, but community members helped me. They upgraded my extension to 45, and that is the general thing which we are seeing that GNOME uh, extensions break with new versions, so we can have a bit of less breakage in that area. We can embrace extensions again for future reviews for that new activities toggle. There was also one for the quick toggles before that, and this, this was great because we, we can test these features on our old shell without really compiling the new shell again. And we can take part in improving the extension ecosystem, the GNOME extensions website, the GNOME extensions CLI tool, uh, having more tools to up upload extensions, a lot of people are asking for that. So if we have more support in these areas, then it will not only empower the GNOME extensions, but it will also empower the users who are using them on a daily basis. What can we do as normal contributors. First of all, we can contribute more to the extension ecosystem. We can create more extensions for it. We can create more documentation. We can help developers in need because if it weren't for those developers who helped me in my early days, I might not be standing over here. I might not have become a GNOME contributor. And it was those developers on the GNOME metrics channel, Element, GNOME newcomers channel, GNOME hackers channel, all those developers who helped me become a contributor to what I am, and that is the thing which we want to promote more. Having a safe place where developers can ask any questions and they can get answers. We can help port extensions, for example, uh, I got a lot of help in porting my extension by developers, so we can have more of that. We can help new developers on metrics again, we can help extensions dev with their code, and we can also create something of our own, our own extensions, just to empower the whole ecosystem that, okay, I want this and I will create this so I can modify the shell without really uh, going through all the hoops of creating issues and going through that and just having an extension which supports your way of doing things. So thank you everyone and if anyone has any questions then yeah, I'll be great to answer that. Yeah. Yeah, so because they are modifying the shell, it will take a toll uh, on your performance, but it is again that if you have hundreds, uh, it, it is also boosting your productivity. So if it is a part of GNOME shell, then also it will take performance hit. If it's not part of GNOME shell, then, then also it will take performance hit. So it is just a matter of fact that you want that feature, and that is the beauty of this space that if you have all those features inbuilt, then you have hundreds of extensions or hundreds of features which you might not want, but they are increasing the code base, increasing the size, and just taking a performance hit. With this, you can have those same features, but tailor it according to your needs, so you don't have those extra things and you only have uh, the things you need. And in that case, the compromise is uh, not an issue. Uh, 
Um, so the question was how these extension works well with the teams which are in GTK. Uh, so actually that is the misc uh, what I interpreted on the whole movement which was around don't theme my apps movement was that they wanted that the uh, distributions don't do it. It was if a person wants to theme their app, they can do it. It's their choice, their app, again it's open source, whatever you want to do with it. You can even change the code to have that theme in built into the application itself. The movement was against having that pre-installed to people who don't want those things changed. For example, if you are a person in need of accessibility, and this was a talk which I did at uh, Guadec this year, that for people with accessibility, you have to consider a lot of things about how the colors should be looking, how the icons should be, and Gnome does a lot of work in this area to make the application accessible. If you theme those, those accessibility settings are gone, those nice things are gone, but again, they are not against giving that feature to the users. If the user want it, they can do it because it's their system. If they want to use it a certain way, if they want red and green colors, if they want a cat on their system, it's their choice and no one uh, should actually bother with that. But if it's shipped by default, then many users don't customize their desktop as well. And for those people, it can become a problem. So uh, Gnome extensions work well with that, and if you want it, you can enable it and theme your apps without any issues, and I don't think even the developers are against that in that criteria. Um, my question was regarding uh, the additions, the extensions, not the applications. So how well do these things work with the extensions? Uh, so how do teams work with extensions? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, depending on uh, it works across. Again, if you are modifying your shell in any way by including themes or anything like that, then it will cause issues in certain sectors where they are not expecting that change to happen. But most of the times, it doesn't uh, have a problem because if no extensions are more like applications itself, if their settings are considered, uh, so they won't be breaking. If the application is breaking, then those will also be breaking. And regarding the shell, teams don't change the shell. So they just add colors or change the colors. So it can have accessibility issues, maybe color mismatch, but that is because uh, the theme is not matching with what we have done with the environment itself and nothing more than that. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, okay, so are the extensions sandboxed to the GNOME shell? Because as you said, they are simply distributed as zip files. So can that bring forth any privacy and security concerns for the installers? So uh, the developers thought of that, and that's why we have a website called extensions.gnome.org. If you upload extension there, which is the official way to get extensions, it is first reviewed by the GNOME developers, the extension developers, which have been there for a long time, to check if it does anything malicious. The whole source code is available to them, they check it, and if certain thing like that happens, then they just reject that extension. So uh, it is recommended don't download extensions anywhere from the web, but download from the official website, so you know whatever you are getting is safe for you to modify your shell. So I think we are out of time, so yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you, Mr. Kaushik, for such an informative session. Now it's time for parallel sessions. Uh, Mr. Kotiswari is going to have a session over here, and Mr. Bayu is going to have a session on the other room. Kotiswari to come up for your presentation.
हेलो एवरीवन होप यू कैन हियर मी लाउड एंड क्लियर एम आई ऑडिबल ओके uh well uh, let's uh, get started welcome everyone once again so so today my topic is open doors to open source like empowering asia like blah 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 but uh, the main thing is like we need to open doors to open source how we can do it like uh, the building communities like uh, we uh, right till now we are understood community is important and lot of things are happening uh, through the community open source a lot of stuff but how do you build the community that is challenging right so my talk goes around this okay uh, well all good things has to start with good things right so here comes a quotation which comes from steve jobs innovation distinguishes between a leader and a follower so there might be lot of things lot of products which uh, you know coming out and going out but the true leaders will be you know distinguished from the other ones you might be why i am telling all those things right like in open source anything is possible it, it is not like you know take me as an example like uh, one year ago i never been to uh, i am from india i never been to any place like uh, going abroad you know crossing india border is like a dream for me uh, starting uh, contributing to open source in the span of year i visited five countries as a speaker so it might be uh, a, big, a small contribution that you make today towards community towards open source but it might be the next thing you might be next gnome head you might be uh next uh red hat head or you might be uh, leading lot of uh, the global teams which you never thought of so lot of uh, i'll quickly go through a simple agenda i have a five point agenda uh, a simple introduction and importance uh, the challenges building communities uh, strategies you know for collaborating uh, for collaborations and a simple case study so it's a simple five point agenda so before that like who am i why i'm speaking here right so my name is koti velenki so i'm working as a devops engineer for adobe uh, many of you heard about it so i'm a open source enthusiast like i mentioned i uh, run a couple of communities in india or uh, docker communities pycon communities uh, uh, i'm active organizer for lot of those communities and you can find me in uh, linkedin or x formerly called as twitter uh, i am available everywhere so i'll just quickly jump into this uh, introduction uh, and i i don't want to you know bore with the same stuff which justin uh, himself uh, you know covered pretty much we haven't uh, prepared pr a presentation together i am in india he is in us but most of the introduction and everything is pretty much covered so i'll try to uh, skip those introduction part because uh, we know here and we are aware of love, open source and the stuff the traditional things and all so let's just focus on the benefits right benefits of this open source operating system at scale so there are multiple things and uh, these three are the highlights of those right whenever uh, whoever uh, like you, if you are planning to build a product you are planning to uh, do something innovative so why do you care about all these things right so uh, the uh, at that point right so you need to uh, get into these things economic benefits like a uh, lot of the startups every day a new startup is coming with some new idea it take as uh, any of the uh, silicon valley right so uh, and uh, a year ago, or couple of years ago when pandemic happened everybody is scared like how the communication will happen how the education will turn out there is no way to interact with each other there are lot of products which came up in this edtech sector which we never thought of right hybrid models came in people are working remotely L lot of things are happening everything is possible right just uh, if you have the support of open source thing and you have the things 
uh, the initial bootstrapping itself it has to be very clear and you know you, you never if that is the feasibility you have in your product then everything will uh, fall in place so if you have uh, you know come across this economical uh, things then comes the technology so like uh, in the previous like we should uh, uh, talked about right no extensions so everybody will have different different needs in this right so uh, to customize desktop or to create a product you have n number of things what if you are getting everything as in a free format right and you can make use of it it's not only free it's a open source one so there is there is a clear dif uh, difference between getting free and getting open source like you can in free you can just consume it for free when you say open source like you can contribute it you can customize it you can you know create your own version of it so that's the advantage we have and that brings the thought point of freedom for developers so developers when may have n number of thoughts if you don't have the flexibility of customizing it you never uh, you know uh, have a thought of customizing it so when you are uh, using open source products or open source operating systems this can uh, it gives you literally freedom for developing anything so uh, with that so i it, i'll take into the another uh, insight so it's just a random statistics uh, which uh, have, uh, some of them are covered by justin so right now like uh, almost 70% of operating uh, mobiles which you are running uh, are running with android operating system which is open source and the next or uh, dominant one is ios which is commercial one which is uh, having around 29% and like i mentioned so uh, according to uh, some statistics on 2022 so um, almost 75% of uh, operating systems uh, which are uh, servers operate servers are running on uh, linux and remaining are uh, around 23 or uh, uh, windows servers and the rest is mac os and then uh, like more than 95% of 500 supercomputers like uh, many countries are you know building their own supercomputers for different different problem statements but 90 percent more than 90 percent of them are run using linux so again uh, everything is open source so and th there is an estimate uh, from the uh, uh, lot, lot of uh, research service which, which is telling that by 2026, the open source mar so, uh, software market will touch more than 267 billions by 2026. And again, so when you have the uh, deep customization and you have the uh, you know, control over uh, applications and you know uh, uh, softwares through open source, developers will absolutely love it. So that is where eight out of every ten developers are using open source software, and then. Uh, the recent uh, again the linux foundation uh, in the kubecon last month announced it, that uh, if somebody you know wanted to develop a linux kernel by themselves right so it will cost minimum of 5 billion dollars 5 billion us dollars to build a linux kernel which is uh, out there for free through open source so now uh, we understood right uh, open source is uh, really making some sense and you know uh, we everybody wanted to build uh, you know something related to open source but what are the challenges we get in this uh, journey right so uh, whenever you wanted to start or build something technical expert is a big question so somebody written code and uh, uh, some part of the world and uh, you are uh, trying to uh, consume it and if we have a clear documentation, that is where documentation takes place. If you don't have how to install or set up a few of the things, and you know uh, it will be helpful, but you don't know how to set up, that's a big challenge, right? And uh, you know how to get started, and you don't know how to customize it, because you adapted it for the customization, and you wanted to customize it, but you don't know how to do it then it becomes a bigger challenge. So these are the technical expertises which a lot of communities or a lot of things, uh, open source softwares which are still lagging. I mean, dominant players uh, who are, uh, you know, have a strong community, they're uh, keeping track of, uh, uh, take a Kubernetes as a project example. So there is a separate team uh, for the documentation so they'll go uh, whenever a simple uh, page of document written it will go through multiple checks 
and the Kubernetes release team will have a close eye on like how these things are happening. Is uh, every command executed properly? And does it causing any issues? If, if any issue came, then how to debug it? So what are uh, all these detail, tiny details also keeping in place of the documentation to overcome this issue. And uh, the second thing is like language and cultural barriers. So this is one of the, uh, the I personally uh, relate this much because when you say, uh, la, it's a the crazy experience happened uh, uh, last month when I was on PyCon APEC, uh, which happened in Japan. So I belong to India and I went there and uh, we're sp uh, speaking with a couple of co-speakers and uh, attendees and everything. So we are speaking in uh, English. So one person, uh, he came from United States and he asked me like, uh, he asked me, you guys all from the same country, why you are not speaking the same language? But that's the uh, problem we have in India. We have like uh, more than 20 languages which are uh, officially approved. And every part of the country, every state, I can say literally, uh, most of the uh, states will have different language. So it is easier to communicate with us in the uh, English. So a uh, lot of people don't understand that because we are, even though we are in the same part, same country, but we have a different cultures and different languages and the stuff. Imagine you are talking about the whole world, right? A developer sitting in Japan, uh, write one uh, wonderful application you want to consume it. And uh, a person sitting in Taiwan uh, developed one application, which is also another use case last uh, two months back when you are doing PyCon India. So I was, uh, we are, uh, you know, kind of thinking to uh, build one application for uh, users, right? For the registration, for the check-in, all this process to automate that. And we are looking for one application, and we came across an application which is developed in Taiwan, and the application is in Chinese, uh, Chinese Mandarin language. No, none of us uh, know know how to uh, customize it at that point. So. Again, we started it, but we couldn't able to complete it because of the language barriers we have. So it might be a challenge for you, but once you overcome it and once you, uh, you know, find the ways to overcome it, it will be cakewalk for you. And then uh, sustainability and funding. This is one of the key factor. So again, there is a story like uh, uh, Microsoft uh, ha wanted to uh, build a lot of developer communities and they started a community called Azure Developer Community when they uh, launched Azure Cloud. So it is uh, across the world uh, and in India itself like we, uh, I'm one of the Azure developer lead that time, uh, I was. So there are, uh, we plan to build uh, these communities for the 100 cities in India. Okay, uh, what is happening? Uh, whenever we do uh, a meetup or conference uh, at that particular city or area, people are coming uh, for the sake of goods or something, and uh, w there is no, you know, a proper contribution from the people. So, so, communities or meetups or any sort of things will survive only with the people. It's not about funding, right? So, when you have the potential people who are willing to contribute by spending their time, you know, by contributing in any means, right, then uh, funding will come automatically. So, but uh, again, I'm not telling uh, it's not a challenge. It is a challenge, but more than the funding and uh, these things, uh, getting the relevant people is big challenge. So now, and we understood the challenges. So now what are the strategies, right, uh, now to overcome those? So everything, uh, like I said, localization and education. Right. Uh, like I mentioned, so language or any sort of culture, uh, if you don't want that to be a barrier, you need to localize this thing, right? You, you uh, like uh, the reason uh, no Asia is here is to attract for the Asian con continent. So previously uh, it, it was in Europe, so, uh, previously it was in uh, North America. So why they are, uh, you know, building these many chapters? Because to, if you say, uh, uh, if you have any local chapter, if you want to, uh, it will be uh, kind of home for you, right? You can go and you can interact, you, you know the people. There will be more people and there will be more hands, right, you, you, which can uh, solve the problem quickly. And then community building and outreach, again. So there might be multiple things. You can uh, do a workshops, you can do a regular talks and you can uh, take problem statements and 
hey, uh, uh, for this, uh, yeah, like th there might be th different themes, right? So, uh, hell, uh, you take health as a theme, you take uh, uh, IT, sustainability, every, everything can be a theme and you can uh, build communities or build conferences around it and you, know, you can reach more people and get more insights. Finally, again, funding. So when you are uh, planning for these many big conferences and all funding might be big challenge, but when you have the right people, uh, you know, when you show the right enthusiasm, fund, you will get funds. Now, a simple uh, case study which I wanted to uh, get into is like uh, Collabnix. Collabnix is one community uh, which uh, is in uh, India. So th it's a community of the people, developers. So we, uh, it started like around six years ago. So initially there were very less people, like around 20 to 30 people. And now uh, we do conference every month in Bangalore. Okay, Bangalore is a part of uh, India, I uh, know uh, uh, many of you are aware of. So, no matter what, like, like you mentioned, whatever the strategies we, which I mentioned in my previous slide, we are following the same, we are not doing any rocket science, we are just uh, following the simple steps of interacting with people, speaking and giving them the chance. If you are attendee of uh, one of our meetup and we'll encourage you to deliver content on the next meetup, on any of the topic which you like to. Right, and like I said, uh, there are uh, en enormous things which you can explore and you know exhibit. So we give you the chance to uh, come and exhibit those things. So that is where it started and it uh, going and going. Uh, after six years when we uh, came across like yesterday, uh, when I landed in Nepal, uh, we got news that we touched 14K users in our community group. It's a simple local community, but it's a vibrant community. So. Yeah, that's all I have. Any questions? Yes. So I found those strategies you outlined for building the Asian engagement to be really insightful and interesting. My question is, you know, looking at existing open source communities from GNOME to Fedora, you know, what are things that you think would be helpful to enable those strategies to be successful from these communities? Or like, what can these communities do to help those strategies be successful? Yeah, uh, it depends on, like, uh, it comes into the themes part, like when you have a set of people, especially uh, it, uh, in our community, what we do is like, uh, one month we do a Docker meetup, one month we do a Kubernetes meetup, one month we do a AWS meetup. So it depends on a theme, like uh, uh, that is where we can uh, reach out to specific people on the specific needs. So uh, like you mentioned in your question, like if you wanted to build a Fedora community or if you want to know who are the people who are building uh, on Fedora or GNOME uh, for that matter, right? If you have that theme, then uh, it will directly, uh, you know, uh, directly push, a, uh, push one, uh, one step to that particular people. Then if I'm going, right, I, I, I'm working on a GNOME extension and if I'm going to deliver a talk, few of my friends will come with me and they'll also try to learn. It's like, uh, you know, uh, fixing on theme and uh, once, you, once you do multiple, uh, several meetups on several themes, we'll understand who are the potential people who will pull in. So that is where uh, it's again connecting the dots. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Any more questions? Thank you, thank you. Uh, I'll be around if you have uh, any queries regarding building community or any sort of that thing. Keep up uh, your good spirit in building communities and learning and growing together with the community. Thank you and love you all. Thank you, Mr. Kutishwari, for such an invaluable session. It's time for lunch now. Let's reconvene at 3.25 after lunch. We hope to continue these activities. 
Yes. Uh, before heading for the lunch, uh, let's gather for a group photo in the ground floor, please. In the ground floor? Okay. We can gather for the pictures here.
back. I hope everyone enjoyed their lunches. Now we're going to have parallel sessions. Uh, Mr. Jens Peterson is going to have a session about declarative GTK programming in this room. Uh, Mr. Daniel is going to have a session on how to collaborate with Genome as a visual designer in room number 14. So please uh, move accordingly. I'd like to ask Mr. Peterson to start with his presentation. Uh, can you hear me okay? Is the audio good? Okay. So, um, thank you for being here. Um, this talk is about declarative user interfaces. Um, so, a little bit of background. Um, some of the things here are more coming from kind of web applications, um, uh, UI, designing graphical user interfaces is quite complicated. It's not very easy, maybe some of you have tried and uh, it's easy to get into kind of inconsistent states and uh, have various uh, problems and bugs arise. Um, so in order to circumvent that or to kind of attack that problem, people started looking at more kind of functional approaches to uh, creating user interfaces. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we'll, we're going to start um, talking a bit about Elm, which is a, a um, functional uh, programming language which compiles to JavaScript, actually. so. I guess the first half of the talk is not really about GTK, but it's more about yeah, um, the declarative aspect of creating a user interface. And the second half of the talk will be more uh, looking at some examples, uh, some libraries and examples in GTK. Um, um, yeah. So, I mean, just to motivate a little bit more, the idea is to kind of have a more uh, clear separation of concerns of kind of the state and uh, the logic and the actual user interface. Um, and so kind of by restricting the, uh, the so the way information flows within the application, it, it, it makes things simpler and uh, hopefully easier to maintain. Um, and hopefully without losing much performance too, since um, because, um, as we'll see, because the application is kind of described in pure functions, then it's possible to optimize the rendering. Um, though we won't actually go into the runtime details in this talk. Um, okay. Um, so I don't know, if you want to follow along, oh, the slides are a bit small, aren't they? Um, yeah, the slides are available um, online, but anyway, um, also, yeah, feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions too. Um, all right, let, let's talk a little bit about Elm. Um, so it's a pure functional language that compiles to JavaScript. Um, it's a little bit, I mean, the language is actually written in Haskell and well, I mean, it's not it's not Haskell, but it's quite close to Haskell. Um, it's also quite user friendly. Um, there's usually only one way to do things in Elm. Uh, it has very good error messages, and um, yeah, there's usually no runtime errors and things like that. So it's quite nice to work with. Um, and yeah, it's actually being used in various, I mean, sort of uh, production environments for. 
yeah, uh, JavaScript applications and so on. But, um, I need to keep track of the time. Okay. Um, so yeah, there's going to be various kind of types that we're dealing with. Uh, one is messages, which are kind of about information about sort of changes that are coming in, into the applications, maybe triggered by the user in, through the UI or other ways. Then there's the model, which has the actual sort of state for the application, and then the UI, which in this case will be HTML. And these will be, uh, yeah, then, then there'll be these three sort of functions. The view function, which actually renders the, uh, uh, the UI, and there's an update, uh, function which uh, transforms a model and there's some initial state in the init function. So anyway, this will all become more precise and clear in a moment. This is sort of just setting the scene and until all the heavy lifting is done by the runtime, which is sort of a, it's going to be a black box today. Um, yeah, we'll discuss the actual runtime system. But um, yeah, I, don't, I just want to say a few words about types. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail, but essentially there, there's, there are product types, um, so things like records or um, uh, tuples and so on, things that are kind of combining multiple types into a bigger structure. And then there are some types, which are things like uh, enumerations, so these are the Either or kind of t so these are sort of yeah values where the one of the value is one of these uh, values here like a yes or no or a color. However, we can have more uh, refined types, so uh, so we can combine the sum types and the product types into sort of so-called algebraic data types. So um, yeah, here we have some type constructors, which are, um, well, these are also type constructors up here in the products. Um, anyway. Um, and maybe most important is the functions. Um, so the function notation is a little bit unusual if you're not used to it. Um, the, yeah, it's, I don't want to go into too much detail, but so basically, the, so here we have a simple function which adds two numbers, x and y. But the point is the type signature is written in this sort of unusual way, um, int, uh, arrow, int, arrow. Um, yeah, so anyway, just bear with it. <laughs> so, the, the, so the x is the first int, and the y is the second int, and then the result is the final int. Um, yeah. Well, p part of the reason for this is that uh, functions can be partially partially applied, but anyway, I, I don't want to go into too much detail on this. Um, and so, yeah, so basically the model of the state of the application will be designed, will be described by some um, algebraic data type, or even just a simple uh, type, like an integer or something. Um, yeah. Okay. So, all right, so this is the first example. It's a very simple example. Um, okay, since I'm using my own laptop, um, perhaps I can open up this editor here. Um, however, it may be too small to see. I don't know. Oh, that's not very good, is it? I'm sure I can. Um, Uh, where am I? Oh, I see. Sorry. Um, I think I'll start here because it's uh, easier to see, hopefully. Can make it a bit bigger. Um, well, first there are some imports. We'll skip those. Um, so the model here is very simple. It's just an integer. And the initial value of the model will be, uh, will be zero. So this is a counter, um, and there'll be two buttons to increase and decrement the counter. It's a sort of a, almost a kind of a hello world type uh, 
simple uh, application. And then there's an update function, and the update function will receive some message. Um, should either be increment or decrement, um, and then it will modify the model. In this case, it will either increment our model or decrement our model, which is just this integer. And finally, it's um, there's a view function which maps our model into the actual HTML of the application. Uh, so it's described with a a div here, there's a button, and uh, yeah, there's some properties here. Like if you click on this first button, it will decrement, and the label of the button is minus. Um, and the second, uh, yeah, there's the uh, integer which is displayed, and then there's another button to increment the uh, increment it. Um, and finally, we have a main function here. And uh, I'll explain a bit more about this sandbox runtime later, but and then we just set up these four, three functions, the init function, the update function, and the view function that we defined. And then we can try to run it. Um, let's see if I can. OK, so I'm not sure if you can see this. Um, let me try and make it a bit bigger. Um, so yeah, so here. Here it is over here, running in this uh, editor, and we can, uh, not very exciting, but anyway, that uh, works, yeah. Um, okay. Um, yeah. All right, um, I think we'll move on. Um, so yeah, this turnbox uh, function, uh, which is the simplest way of running an application, it's, so it's basically like a little widget, um, so it's isolated from the rest of the world in a sense. It can't really communicate with the world, it's just a little bit of HTML inside a uh, widget, yeah. so. This is the simplest kind of uh, thing you can do with Elm. Um, and these lower, I didn't really explain, these lower, so the, the types are on the right hand side here. And these lower case uh, types are type, are type variables. Um, yeah, so they can, so this model could be an arbitrary type and there could also be some arbitrary message, but this, the model which appears here is the uh, yeah. It's all the same type. Uh, so sort of like, for example, it could be the integer we just defined, uh, and the message would be like the increment decrement. Um, okay. So rough, roughly speaking, the runtime looks a bit like this. We start with some initial state defined by our initial function. That's then rendered with the view function. Um, when we click those buttons, we generated these increment decrement messages, which are then forwarded to the update function, which updates our model, and then it's then rendered again. There could be more messages, and it, yeah, it just continues like this uh, forever, basically. Um, okay. I have another example. Um, so this is with a text field. Um, and in this case, uh, we're actually reversing the text. Um, yeah. And uh, well, I could just run it. I guess if I don't have a look. So I have some text here. Um, yeah. So. Not too exciting, but that's, yeah, that's what it does. So, but yeah, it's the same kind of pattern again. We have a model. In this case, it's a string initialized to an empty, no content. Um, the message is just 
the change of the updated string. Um, so yeah, if we and um, right. Any, anyone got any questions so far? Anything? Where does the update method get the new content for? Right. So, yeah, uh, that's a good question. So, oh, message has message has the yeah. So, okay. Right. So, the, yeah, when you type something in here, then it will um, send a change message, uh, which will then yeah go into this update function, and that will then update the model with the, uh, the new content, uh, yeah. Um, so when, you, when you're creating the div with the input, does an input construct something out of It's textual contents and the change uh, message. I think so. Uh, <coughs> okay, maybe maybe it's just syntax anyway. Thank you. Yeah. The <laughs> so maybe we could try one thing just to, just to show the. Uh, This is the same code over here, but um, so there's an exercise. Let, let's try and add a little bit of code to um, to show the length of the string, if I can. Um, so add some text here, and. Uh, I've already forgotten what I'm saying. Oh, yeah. String length. So. Um, okay, we can try. Let's see, this this won't work actually because uh, yeah. So so here we got a uh, type mismatch um, because this. The length is an integer, and the text is expecting a string. So we have to, again, convert this. Um, I think it's like this. Um, So yeah, so I include this from int function and then the string length and then the let's see if this works. Okay. So now um yeah, you can see it's yeah. All right. Um I have a third example, but I might skip it. Um, well, this is an example of basically password input. So the, here, the mod, the um, the model is just uh, with three strings: the name, password, and then the password again. Uh, the model starts off empty; everything's empty. And then there are three. So we can get messages for the username, message for the password, and messages for the second password. So for the three, there'll be three fields, right? One for. 
Um, and then again, we update the model. This is pretty much similar to the previous. It's just there are three different fields here. Um, and then, yeah, there's input fields. And uh, But one interesting thing here is that we are going to do some little bit of validation. <laughs> we'll check that the two passwords are the same. So if they're the same, then they'll be green. Otherwise, uh, yeah, they'll be highlighted in red. Um, Let's we'll see how this looks. So, uh, I can't type. <laughs> um, yeah. um, okay. All right. Any questions about this example or so far? Anyone got any more? Um, so earlier I introduced this sandbox runtime, which is rather, it's a little bit limited. It can't do very much. So there are some more complex runtimes like this element thing, which can do, has a little bit more <laughs> power. It can do these things called commands. And also it has subscriptions. So subscriptions are a bit like something you can listen to. Uh, like it could be a clock sync or something like that. Whereas commands are things that are not actually, um, well, it could be some other thing that's done by the runtime other than just rendering. It could be like running some IO or other things or fetching something from the network. Uh, so yeah, this this is a bit more powerful. Um, yeah. Um, so I think this is the last Elm example. Um, this is a dice. Um, so the die face is an integer. It's probably not really precise enough, but anyway, it's for now it's okay. Uh, we'll just start with the one, and then there'll be no command. And so we can either roll the dice or we get a new face uh, event. Those are the two messages. Um, so if we're rolling the dice, this is an example of a command here. So we're actually going to do some do some random number generation. Um, so again, this is a pure function. So it's not actually doing the number generating. That's done by the runtime. But we're just describing what we want uh, the, uh, that the, uh, this roll command to do. Um, otherwise, we do no command, but we have uh, we update the model with the new number that we got. Uh, there's no subscription here. Um, yeah, and the UI is just basically showing the dice, and then there's this button to roll the dice. Uh, so it's fairly simple, I think. Um, Um, yeah, so just like that. Um, oops, that way over. Um, I lost my slides. Um, excuse me. Okay. Right. So this is an example using this uh, extension with so-called commands. Uh, so this is a, yeah. This is a more complicated runtime now. So there could be commands in the init function uh, to set to start up the application. Then there's messages again updating. Again, there could be some command generated and so on. So it's just a kind of a little bit more complicated runtime. All right, so then the question arises, that, so that was the Elm architecture, this kind of thing with the init update view uh, sort of functions. So then the question is, can we do the same <coughs> thing in uh, GTK? And yeah, the answer is yes, we can. <laughs> um, and again, I want to keep things pretty pure, so I'll, I'll start with some uh, 
examples in Haskell. Um, so there, there are several GTK bindings for Haskell. There's an older GTK to HS, uh, which only goes up to GTK3. And then there's newer bindings using uh, the G object introspection, uh, so generated by this uh, Haskell GI uh, library, which, uh, which is both GTK3 and 4. Um, Federico, can you help me with this name? <laughs> Uh, this name, yeah. How do you pronounce? Oh, okay, thank you. Great. <laughs> um, yeah. So he's the main developer of this. Uh. So here's a very simple. This is not declarative. This is just a simple uh, GI GTK uh, sort of hello world program. Um, so we have a. So um, I don't know how many of you have done any GTK programming before, uh, ever. Uh, okay, a few people. Okay, uh, some people. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm afraid I don't have time <laughs> to explain the basics of GTK, but um, anyway, I uh, hope you can sort of get the general idea. So yeah, first we need, and then um, yeah. So well, one thing I need to explain is these arrows in Haskell, uh, this means we're doing some kind of I.O. here and then we're getting some value out of it. In this case, we're getting a window being generated. Um, and these are kind of there's properties inside here. So in this case, we're setting the title of the window. Um, yeah. And then if the window is destroyed, we're going to quit the application. And then we have a click a button, which um, yeah, which we can click. Uh, if we click it, then it will. Then there will be some label, uh, which will say uh, thanks. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, I forgot to compile this program, so I'm not going to actually demo this. But anyway, I don't think it's so exciting to see it. Anyway, so, um, but you can see that this is a bit different from the earlier declarative stuff we did. Um, yeah, it's a little bit more. Messy or well, not really messy, but everything's kind of. There's no kind of separation of the uh, states and the uh, UI and so on. So yeah. So, however, uh, this guy Os Oscar Wikström, a uh, Swedish guy, made a um, kind of a la library on top of the GI GTK called GI GTK Declarative. Um, uh, unfortunately, it's only for GTK3, uh, and it's uh, no longer maintained, so yeah, it would be nice if someday it got updated for GTK4, but... Um, right, so, so here's an example. This is again, basically the counter example again, uh, but now uh, as a GTK application. Um, so let's see if we can spot any of the patterns we saw. So. There's a little bit of naming changes here. Instead of model, um, it's being called state, but basically the same thing. And there's an integer. And instead of messages, we have events. But anyway, it's basically the same thing. So again, we have increment, increment, decrement. But we also have a closing uh, event here. So it's a little bit more than just the uh, counter we had. And then the view function. Um, so it creates a window um, with some. Um, so yeah, we can destroy the window uh, if there's a destroy a delete event, and there's a size request, and then inside the window there's a container uh, with a vertical box, and uh, there's some children inside the box. Poor children, <laughs> um, and. Uh, yeah, and then we have these buttons, uh, plus, minus, and uh, yeah, also the, uh, the label up here. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, yep, and we also have the up update function. So here we are using primes because Haskell doesn't like uh, to repeat these, um, yeah. 
things again, yeah. So, and it's a little bit different. We have a so-called transition type over here. Uh, so we have the model and the message, and then that generates. Um, but yeah, basically it's it's yeah same idea um, as we had earlier in the R, the R architecture. Um, okay, I could try to run this. I think. Uh, let's see if I can. Just a moment. I made some small changes. I think. Okay, it's a bit small, but um, and I probably can't make it bigger. But yeah, this is uh, uh, just a counter here, and we can close the window too. So. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, any questions on this? All right. Um, there's a second example. Um, so this one is um, kind of using. So this one has a countdown, basically. Um, so it sort of. Or maybe I show it to you first, and it maybe makes more sense. Um, so, yeah. I'm sorry, it's pretty small, but it says exit in the middle there. So if I click on this button, uh, it starts counting down, exiting two, three, one, and disappears. Um, yeah. So, so there's two state state here is either it's either running or it's about to, or it's counting down to exit in uh, some in in seconds um, and the message is either exit or or count or count down uh, um, yeah and then yeah, the view function just yeah displays what we saw. Um, um, and this exiting in here contains the number of seconds left. Um, and yeah, so there's a little. So so it's using a thread just to uh, to wait one second between each. Uh, each update, basically. Um, all right. Um, I think I'm running short on time, so I may skip this uh, third example. Well, I can just show it to you, but. Uh, uh, so again, it's a little small, but. There's a few buttons I can add um, things here. Uh, so basically, the yeah, there are vectors uh, holding those um, two sets of uh, boxes. Um, yeah, but uh, I think I won't go into too much detail here because it's a little bit uh, tricky with the types. Um, and there's one more layer on top of the GTK declarative uh, library, which is this GTK, GI GTK declarative app simple, which um, has some extra um, syntactic sugar, if you like, or well, but basically has some simpler wrapper functions around to make it more palatable. Um, and again, we see the application defined in the same kind of way as before. It's the update function, which takes state, event, and then has some transition. 
uh, the view which maps the uh, state into the application view inputs or the, uh, the basically the subscriptions uh, and then the initial state so yeah and then I'll just show a couple of applications um, which were made using GI GTK declarative. Uh, this, this one I wrote myself. It's basically a port of uh, a tool called Fonts Compare, which is now in Python. Uh, yeah, but basically it just shows two different fonts um, in a two so text in two different fonts, so you can compare how uh, fonts look. Um, Perhaps I can run it very quickly. Um, so I have it here. Um, well, maybe bigger. Um, so yeah, for example. Um, I don't know. So here's an example with some uh, Devanagari. Um, the top font is Noto Sans Devanagari. The lower one is Droid Sans Devanagari. Uh, actually, looks surprisingly similar, but anyway, yeah. This is Japanese. Um, anyway. The other application, which was written by the author of the uh, GI GGK declarative, is this video editor, um, which is quite a nice tool. Unfortunately, it's a bit difficult to build now, so I won't be demoing it, but anyway, you can read about it um, there. So it can sort of do cutting and so on and editing of videos. So. I think I'm running short of time. I want to touch very briefly on Rust uh, Realm 4. So, so originally there was a Realm library based on GGK3 and, uh, and it's sort of been rewritten in this uh, or forked into this Realm 4 project. Um, again, here's a sort of simple example. Uh, it's a little bit more verbose as you can see, but um, yeah. Uh, but again, it's just a counter. So we've got this, the model here, uh, the messages, increment, decrement, uh, and uh, yeah, this generates a uh, GTK uh, widget. Uh, I think maybe I can even show it. Oops. Um, anyway, um, let's see if there's time to show it or not. Um, anyway, that's more or less the uh, talk I wanted to give today. Um, I hope I've somewhat convinced you that declarative UIs are sort of simpler, easier to maintain and debug and scale, and hopefully whetted your appetite a bit, maybe trying it out yourselves. Um, you could um, have a look at the, there's very nice documentation for Elm, so I think I'd recommend starting there. Um, you can also read some of the other resources like for GI, GTK, Declarative, or Realm 4. Um, there's also a quite nice blog post by Rakuten, who are using Elm in production. Um, in fact, there, there are many interesting projects uh, happening. Um, there's also, yeah, um, so, it's quite an active, it's a, it's a bit of a renaissance of functional programming in this sort of UI space, so, which is quite nice to see. Um, yeah, that's, any questions or hello? Hello, so, uh, we have a question from uh, Utsav, who is participating online, and uh, Utsav says, sorry, this may be a bad question, but is there any reason why we aren't using the real JS here, considering this compiles into JavaScript? 
Oh, okay. <laughs> That's a good question. There's no bad questions, really. Um, well, the, the thing is that JavaScript is, I don't know, it's quite a complicated language. Um, so, in fact, Elm, Elm is, because Elm is sort of simple in many ways and it's, um, it's a safer language, so, it, for example, refactoring JavaScript can be quite messy, I think, whereas um, Elm is rather easier to refactor, so you get more maintainable, safer code, and uh, still good performance. Um, so yeah, it's a little bit like, I mean, there are many other transpilers now, like TypeScript and so on, so you can think of Elm a bit like that, but more type safe. Else? Any other questions? Hey, uh, in future, do we do we expect uh, a support for GTK four? Uh, well, I hopefully, yeah. I mean, okay, so. Um, there are, um, yeah, the the this the realm four is using GTK four, for example. So there are there's also I was looking at another. I don't know if any, how many of you have heard of Nim. There's another language called Nim, which is sort of nice. Uh, it's a bit like a more modern C-ish, but um, but it also has garbage collection. There's also an interesting project there actually. Uh, I didn't call it out, but this uh, owl kettle. Um, I think it's also using GTK4. Um, so, uh, so, yeah. GTK4 right. is available. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, if there are no more questions, well, thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you. Peterson for such an informative session. Now let's, I'd like to call Ms. Andika Trividada for her session.
Hello, uh, hello. Good, good afternoon. Sorry for the delay. So, after some uh, difficult uh, topics, uh, we, uh, right now we will speak. Uh, we will. Uh, I will have a tra uh, presentation about the very, very easy things about the translation. So, uh, let me introduce myself. I'm a GNOME Indonesian. Translation coordinator. I have been the uh, coordinator for uh, 13 years. It's been too long, but no one, no one want to replace me. <laughs> so uh, le uh, let me uh, describe my experience in, uh, on how we doing our translation. Hopefully, some other team that uh, want to do the similar task can 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 get get uh, something from from our experience. May, may, may I use the Not yet. Oh, okay, it's good. Good. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, we start with a reason. Why do we need to translate? In our case, Indonesia has around two, 270 million people. Almost all of them can speak Indonesian, but I'm not sure how, how much they, they know English. Maybe 25% percent, uh, percent or... Uh, 50, I, I don't have the statistic yet, but I think every country has different, different uh, number. The other thing that Indonesia has many, uh, uh, you can say hundreds of languages. Maybe like uh, India, India has m so many languages. Eh? I, I'm not sure about Nepal. How many languages do you, do you use here? At least English. Nepalese and uh, something, but we have 
Um, the, the, the largest one is Indonesian, known by 200 plus million users. Japanese, uh, 84 million, and so, so many uh, languages. So if we, if, if we want to do something that uh, has most impact, we need to translate every software that we, need, we use into uh, Indonesian language. So let's see another statistic. Although we only have around 2,000, uh, 270 something million people, we have how many? Uh, 100. 34 telephones, phone number for every 100 people. So uh, literally that every, uh, on average, every, every one has one and a third uh, handphone number. So we have more numbers than people in Indonesia. So if, if, we, if we want to, to translate something that, that that will be used by more people, we, we can do that by translating uh, mobile application. But, <laughs> but we are talking about GNOME, so, so we should be back to GNOME. Actually, it's, it's quite difficult. I, uh, only 18% of homes in Indonesia has, has computer. So potentially we only have uh, how many? Uh, Eighteen percent times how, how many computers? <laughs> so potentially we have that much uh, computers to, to, to support, but of course you, you, you have to consider that that uh, maybe only how many percent of uh, the people use Linux and use GNOME. Let's say we we take only 10% of, of this, all those people, so 10% uh, times 18 times 270. Can someone, I cannot <laughs> count quickly, how many millions is that? <laughs> so that is the, the, the potential user of our translation in, into Indonesian. So, Okay, so what was the, the state of uh, our transition? Indonesia uh, already reached almost 100%. It is the, the latest, latest version of GNOME, 45. Yeah. And then if we, uh, we, we see the breakdown, uh, the almost 100% is uh, the, uh, the user interface section one. But, but the documentation itself is uh, uh, rather low, uh, only 70% because uh, if, if you compare, if you see the, the, the number here, number here is a st uh, string count. How many lines of uh, string need to be translated? For instance here, GNOME 45, we have roughly 32 million, uh, 32,000 lines of string need to be translated for user interface. But we only need around 6,000 lines of string to be translated. Why? It's only 6,000 compared to 32,000. The problem is, Many of strings here are short one. For instance, if 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 you if you click the menu file file open close save, <laughs> uh, uh, every lines maybe consists of one or two words. This is a different matter uh, because every lines might be a paragraph. Tens, uh, ten words, uh, maybe uh, twenty, thirty, a hundred words. 
So the volume, the real volume, was not represented uh, properly in, in this statistic because it's only set about how many lines. The, the better, the better uh, number would, would be how many words here and how many words there. I'm not sure, do, do we have the statistic in here for the, how many words? <laughs> okay. Good, so the, the statistic, the latest statistic. And, and then you can see that uh, I track this uh, the statistic from uh, GNOME version 230. I start as a coordinator, I'm up to, I think around, around, around this year. Uh, so every year, GNOME released two versions. So if we track back, uh, I, I, I have been at a uh, coordinator for certain years. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Uh, start here. So I start here. We are, we already have almost almost hundred, but but as after several releases, we can keep hundred uh, percent translation. But the documentation itself start uh, get uh, effort very much later. The other thing is that that, that several several modules got dropped from from the so uh, GNOME translation system has uh, categorized uh, things to be done here into several sections. So uh, for instance, uh, I, this blue lines only uh, talk about core core section. If we uh, check the previous statistic, you can see that we have uh, here is core, and then we have Evelyn and friend, Kim, and, and, and so, so, so many, so many uh, uh, different sections. We only focus primarily on this, then after, after we, can, we can finish this, then we, we turn on our uh, focus on, on other modules. So the, the question is how hard to, to do this? We, 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 can, uh, we can only see from here that we, can, we manage, the Indonesian transition team managed to keep transition level good for so many years. But is it hard or is it easy? The first question is how much work do we need to do? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know because uh, we need. <laughs> I need help from from programmer or some or some someone else. That how to calculate, how to calculate how many, how much work in every every uh, GNOME release here. I'm not sure how, how to do that because, for instance, eh, if, if 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 we talk about. Uh, Let's say GNOME Control Center. GNOME Control Center has new string every releases. But how many? How many lines are there? Do you know how? Do you have any idea? If if we have a a, a git, uh, if we have the complete git commits, how do you calculate how many new strings? Between its release, if if you have ideas, uh, I I mean say to to discuss with all of you to to calculate because because uh, this calculation, I think is needed by every language team who do translation. Yeah, to 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 uh, to get a feeling that how much work they they, they uh, do they really need to do. So. What, what I can calculate is how many strings are really translated, re really done in every, uh, I calculate this uh, for only starting from 
2019. So for instance, Gunung Kalkulator. Uh, in 2019, we have done uh, 577 strings translation, and so on. And if you, you, you can see the uh, so so the number here is how many lines translated in uh, for which module in which year. Every year has two GNOME releases. So yeah, you can roughly, uh, you, you can say, uh, maybe uh, every release, uh, the, the number is maybe half of the num uh, number in its box. So this, this is the real translation volume. But it doesn't, it doesn't say about, about uh, how many uh, new strings, how many old strings deleted. It's only talk about we do uh, a, a certain translation. This may be because when, when, when we do translation and then after we review again, oh, I, 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 I would like to change the translation. So, so this doesn't calculate the, re the, the real new strings, uh, how many strings to be translated, but how many change additional maybe because uh, correction or something yeah. so many reason yeah. and then I try to check for uh, uh, who whose name uh, 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 who, who, who do translation in, in the maybe since since I I'm, I'm uh, since GNOME using Git, so I, I try to, to loop every every module that I have Git clone and check check the, the names that it came to how many is it four times five only twenty people do translation for whole GNOME into Indonesia into Indonesian. But if we drill down, uh, I'll, I'll be rather quick. If we, we try to, to check how many commits uh, every year, you can see that it's not, not, not flat. Every year has a different number. This is the number and it's the graph. So sometimes we, we do many many commits, like for instance, uh, 2017, a thousand commits, a thousand commits. So every, re, uh, every room release roughly uh, 500 commits. And then if we uh, break down for several, uh, several modules, who do, uh, really do the commits, we get this this number, Kuku. In in this year, the uh, 500 commits and, and and so on and so on so on. I myself test. Uh, I myself uh, did uh, 600 commits in uh, 2017. Uh, it get get dropped because, uh, in in these years because I have. Uh, several activities, but then back at the big later. So I think this the the, the uh, core of my uh, presentation that that only with two people we can manage to keep translation of GNOME into Indonesian almost 100% for 10 year plus. So if you want to do the similar, you can do too. <laughs> uh, I think, I think the, the, other, the, the rest of the presentation 
might not too interesting. Uh, we can do quickly. So uh, GNOME use L10N. Uh, they, they call it them lies. <laughs> a web a web to do translation coordination. So uh, the, the 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 method to do translation if someone claim that I want to translate this module. So then the, uh, he download the, the file, do translation, and then upload the result. And after that, uh, maybe uh, the uh, translation got reviewed. After review OK, it will be committed. Other project has different way to do translation. For instance, LibreOffice. LibreOffice also break their uh, software translation into modules, but every modules can be translated concurrently by many people in the same times because they use the uh, web-based translation. GNOME only use webs for coordinating. The translation work itself must be done offline using tool, for, for instance, uh, G translate G translator. Uh, what is the trans translation tool from K KDE? Uh, <laughs> I don't remember. We, we usually PO edit. Uh, I uh, I am I am uh, uh, Kuku usually use PO edit, but it uh, doesn't matter. You, you can, for instance, you can use VI to do translation, or you can use whatever text editor to do, to do that. Okay, this is, ah. for instance, we, we, we use pure edit, but uh, it doesn't support editing the header. Uh, part of header is uh, that contain the who do translation in which year. We, we need to edit this manually. What else important? Uh, ah, this one. So, even we have only two active trans translator uh, in 19, uh, uh, 2018. Uh, I have a whole year sabbatical that Kuku can take over. It's okay, uh, but the problem is that if someone came and want to help. We don't have anything easy to, for, for them to, to do because many, many easy models are already 100% done. So how, 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 do you, how do you prepare, prepare new, new, new translator to, to do that? I don't know. Maybe, maybe we, we just take the one module, make it uh, uh, delete all transition and try uh, uh, ask him or her to you retranslate this or something like that. I, I don't know. I, I need ideas from from you. <laughs> so, so this <is> bad. <laughs> and then I'm, I am already 13 years <laughs> uh, as a coordinator. I'm I'm too old. We need fresh blood. But no one no one want to. To replace me, so so anyone, even from from other country, maybe want to replace me? <laughs> no. Okay. As yeah, this one maybe maybe we need discussion with 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 uh, developer, but but it's, it's okay. Uh, I think this the, the end of my presentation. <laughs> this is me. This is Kuku. <laughs> Any question? Thank you.
Thank you so much, Mr. Antika, for his wonderful session. Now it's time for lightning talks. I would like to invite Leon Nunes for presenting on the topic, GNOME as a user interface for hardware devices. Okay, uh, it seems the, uh, Mr. Leon is not here, but probably we can continue with our next uh, speaker. So, Mr. Suraj, is he? Yeah. Okay, he will be... In, uh, yeah, Suraj. 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 Yeah, Suraj. So, he will be presenting, uh, contributing uh, to Posh as a startup, a case study to make some impact on the open source community. So, yeah, I mean, I we, uh, will wait for the slide and... Take it away. Uh, while we waiting for uh, Mr. Suraj uh, preparing uh, his slide, so guys, how's the temperature? Is it too cold for you guys? No? Is it too cold? Oh yeah, I, oh it's too cold. Yeah, too cold for for our speaker in France. So yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, it's a little bit here, but I'm not sure about the local. Is it the local okay? Okay. Uh, yeah, it's no. Is it normal here for you for you guys? This kind of temperature. <laughs> yeah, see, yep. So, yeah, I think he is trying to stick in his cable inside his laptop. Yep, while waiting. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, no one has a joke. No, no, that, that's not a joke. Uh, so, if no one gets a joke, I don't, I'm not sure it's a joke or not. All right, so, okay, okay. Uh, also calling for Mr. Ravin Ranjan. Okay, uh, please stand by here with probably with your laptop if if possible. And also calling for who else? Oh, he's again. Oh, you got you got two slides. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So I think yeah, we can continue. Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, hey everyone, I'm Suraj. So uh, I'll be talking about the topic contributing to FOSH as a startup something about making some impact in the FOSS community. Uh, something about me, uh, I work as a SD at a startup named Peertree. We develop a lot of things from peer-to-peer -peer softwares to open source software, so I'll talk about it later on. So uh, what is exactly Linux on mobile? So it's, it's, uh, it's about Linux intended or targeted for mobile devices. So uh, we do have 
uh, multiple devices, for example, Pine phones and Librem 5 phones, which are explicitly for Linux, but uh, we have an extended community supported phones like OnePlus, etc. So uh, let's talk about what is Linux and mobile. You can you can choose you you do have an option of multiple distributions for your flavor. By the way, my phone runs Arch. Uh, it obviously respects your freedom. You can have repro reproducible builds in Linux. So let's say your vendor says that I'm shipping you open source Android, but they have their own custom ROM. You don't know what they ship you with. They can have spyware inside uh, their operating system. You can run apps natively on Linux. You don't have any um, abstraction layer like Java, runtime, etc. Uh, apart from that, uh, everyone knows how heavy is to run, uh, you know, as complicated or SDKs like Android Studio in your laptop and get your laptop heated on something around 100 degrees Celsius. So you don't need heavy SDKs to build apps for. Uh, Linux, you just need GTK and you can uh, test these applications in a nested setup. Uh, yeah, this, this, the next point is sustainable. I'd be talking more about this in my next presentation, but uh, Linux operating systems tend to have uh, more sustainable approach. For example, post-market post OS says that uh, they are aiming for a 10 year life cycle for the mobile devices they are working on. So what is FOSH? It's something like a desktop environment for Linux on mobile devices. It's similar to running GNOME or KDE in your mobile phone. Uh, it's a graphical shell. It's based on Wayland. So it uses a WL roots based compositor named FOC. It uses GTK and GNOME technologies. Um, primarily, it is developed by Purism. They're for, uh, intended for their uh, Librem 5 phones, um, but uh, these are quite well supported in phones like Pine phones. Uh, these are also very, they do have a very good support in old uh, Android smartphones like OnePlus 6, um, Poco F1, etc. You want to develop applications on top of FOSH. So uh, one thing uh, which is very important in terms of operating systems is that you, you need to onboard developers to build apps for your platform. So you don't, you don't require heavy SDKs. Um, if you want to know more, more, know more about FOSH, you can head down to this website. Um, this is a basic example of what lies there in FOSH. It, uh, so the blue boxes, are GNOME technologies and the white boxes are uh, components of FOSH. So you can see that um, it relies heavily on multiple GNOME technologies and other uh, other interfaces like network manager and modem manager using DBus. So what works and what not? So UX is pretty much smooth. Uh, it for human interaction guidelines. It heavily relies on Libadvaita. For localization, uh, we are onboarding multiple localization effects. For example, we have integrated libvarnum, govarnum with uh, the FOSH on-screen keyboard. So you can have uh, local language transliteration. So for example, uh, I speak Hindi. So I can type in English, I can type in English, and it will get converted to Hindi, similar to you have in your primary smartphones. Uh, one thing that can be a pain point is that banking applications don't build applications for these type of platforms. But anyways, if you want to run Android apps, we do have different kind of projects. For example, Waydroid is a containerization based approach to run Android apps on top of uh, on Linux for mobile. Um, this, uh, these are some basic screenshots of the device. If you want to test it, I do have a Pine phone with me. You can come uh, after this talk and you can t test this FOSH. So what about Pear Tree? We are a startup based out of Bangalore. Uh, we develop peer-to-peer -peer applications. We are specifically focusing on platform inclusive development. So uh, that is why we, uh, we are also focusing on Linux on mobile. For that, we are contributing upstream to FOSH. Uh, 
this is something about the case study what we did so the first uh, thing we approached was taking support from the maintainers of the project uh, shout out to some uh, maintainers of fosh for example guido evangelos uh, we gave the team proper time and resources so we gave them team to uh, we gave them uh, you know resources to learn gtk programming we gave them significant time so that uh, they can get on boarded on this yeah <laughs> uh, we also shipped them with liberated phones so we getting uh, these pine phones are quite difficult in india in terms of custom so we gave them liberated phones like one plus six to test our development stuff uh, we also just, uh, 10 seconds <laughs> We, uh, we onboarded contributors uh, for from GNOME community. So for example, we have uh, previous GSOC students uh, who have worked on GTK technologies and uh, they are interning with us. It's, it's, this case study defines the perfect amalgamation of FOSS and industry and how they can sustain together. Thank you. All right. So I believe, uh, Suresh, you got another presentation, right? Correct. Yeah. Uh, so I think can we can we just jump to your next slide rather than we change uh, after because just to make time minimum. Yeah, sure. Is it I, okay? Yeah, yeah. I had my coffee. All right. Cool. <laughs> okay. So uh, if you if you guys don't know, uh, we actually actually prepare some timer here to just pressure him and others, uh, uh, our lightning speakers uh, here. So probably we can continue for your next talk. Is it okay? Right, right, it's fine. Okay, so the next talk will be titled uh, sustainable, sustainable Computing Using uh, Mobile Linux, correct? Right. Okay, so your, min your five minutes start now. Yeah, so uh, the topic I'm going to talk about next is about sustainable computing, uh, something about climate uh, and a case study I did in my final year as my thesis project. So what exactly is e-waste? It's like you discard away your old smartphones, your old uh, smartwatches and other devices. If we go down to some numbers and statistics, um, let's say I take an average smart uh, smartphone size of nine millimeters so if we stack these phones and uh, we place down that on earth, it, it would reach to 120x distance uh, on top of earth and x is the distance between earth and the International Space Station. So this is what we piled up in uh, till 2022. So what do we have in stake? Uh, these discarded smartphones have recyclable metal, metals, uh, reusable parts, and yeah, let's see, can we use the computational power? So what I did was collect these uh, old Android smartphones, flashed third party firmware on top of it, preferably mobile Linux, made a heterogeneous cluster out of it uh, using this uh, technology called MPI, message passing interface. Uh, we do have implementations on top of it like, like open MPI. I uh, created uh, one SSH cluster uh, using passwordless setup. Um, so the use, the computational power collectively they got was I can host a simple HTML website on top of it. Uh, so you can say that that's not the computational power I want. I want to run my machine learning models on top of it. Well, uh, probably not, but uh, at least we are using some kind of uh, computation resources that you'll be throwing away in your dustbins. Uh, so what are the use cases? What we can do is in, in a collective society, we can collect uh, old devices. Uh, let's say every household has had uh, two to four average uh, smartphones um, stacking up in the, uh, in my dra drawer. And then uh, we can use, the, we can stack up all these smartphones in a room use these uh, use the collective computation resource for let's say playing uh, around um, letting the students learn programming hosting etc what more can be done on top of it uh, we can have a ui wrapper for setup so that so that non tech people can uh, be onboarded into the whole process um, what does this teach us so fos can be 
and catalyst for a catalyst for e-waste sustainability. How can we go towards the sustainable approach? So when we are talking of technology, I think I personally think sustainability should be go in parallel talks with that since uh, we are discussing about climate change, etc. So what we can do is develop sustainable economic models. So uh, we can buy products from sustainable brands. We can optionally choose those kind of products. Designing for repairability. Um, what if your Android smartphone could be repairable, let's say, uh, easily and the additional cost uh, and the vendor lock-in was very much less. This would uh, significantly impact the e-waste that is being generated, promoting open standards and interoperability. So we all know uh, which brand turned their official charging port to type C. Uh, this is what open standards and interoperability is about. Collaboration, yeah. <laughs> Collab collaboration um, with sustainable organizations and uh, trying to catch up with the 17 sustainable development goals that United Nations have um, suggested. Harnessing a circular economy, so a linear economy is that you manufacture, you use it and then you throw it. A circular economy is that you manufacture it, uh, you consume it, especially in this uh, consumer economy and consumer times, uh, when consumerism is in high rise, you manufacture it, you consume it, you try to reuse or recycle it. Thank you. If anyone wants to try FOSH, they can come up to me. I have a pine phone with me. Yep. So, okay. Thank you so much for your set, for your talk. So, um, uh, Rajiv, I can, you, can take the, uh, you can take the floor. You want to... Yeah, can you use your help? It's much, much quicker, <laughs> basically. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Rajiv will be, uh, will be presenting about exploring the power of a GRCP gateway for writing RESTful services. So while he taking uh, some time to just uh, make sure the output is working. So uh, I think Rhythm Narula, uh, are you here? I think virtual present. Virtual present. I'm not sure how's the virtual. Uh, never mind. We, can, we, we, we will work on uh, that later. So uh, once you're ready, I think you, you can just uh, continue for your session. It's a full screen. Yeah. Oh, no, no. I think it won't go. No. It's just that's a full screen. <laughs> okay. Is it fine, right? Okay. Yes, fine. Yes, fine. Okay. Uh, hey, hello, everyone. Uh, good evening. So uh, I will be presenting about a uh, topic called exploring the power of GRPC gateway for writing RESTful services. Uh, so. Uh, so I am Rajiv Ranjan Singh. Uh, I work as software engineer at AP Moller Musk. So people who don't know what's AP Moller Musk, like uh, it's a logistic company and uh, logistic and shipping company. Uh, I graduated last year uh, in from JSS Bangalore. So I'm from India. Uh, I did like I was in open source for uh, like from college days. So I did uh, G Short with uh, GRPC Gateway, and I did uh, same uh, GRPC work with uh, WeChat and and work with Moja Global for uh, like uh, United Nations Climate Change Project. 
and did G-Shock and Captain and I'm mentoring for uh, like a project, uh, um, like I did G-Shock, uh, I participated as a mentor in this year like with Jenkins. So I'm quite active in uh, open source. Uh, so, okay, so, um, so, uh, so I'll be talking more of about REST and uh, what the gRPC is. And then I will go through gRPC gateway and how to use gRPC gateway. I won't go to the I mean code because I have limited time. So uh, obviously you will be knowing about how to write REST APIs and all. So we know like um, uh, REST, REST is a one way to write uh, and do the API stuff and all. Like what we have SOAP uh, in earlier days in 1980s and all we have SOAP and uh, REST come and then RPC call, uh, RPC comes like re remote procedure calls. And uh, and then uh, Google recreated RPC um, called uh, they recreated RPC uh, with name called gRPC. So so okay. So what's the difference between REST and gRPC? So both both is a way paradigm to write APIs uh, like what we have SOAP and all. So basically, gRPC is more uh, like what difference is like gRPC is HTTP two compatible. REST is not. Uh, we have by streaming. So basically, when we uh, when we hit our API and call goes to the server and we get a return, one request, one return happens in REST. But in gRPC, we can do like uh, multiple requests and multiple responses. That's called by streaming. Even we have like uh, backward compatibility support in gRPC. So if any code changes happen, we don't have to take care of like uh, compatibility issues and all. Uh, that's, that's one advantage of gRPC. Uh, one more thing like, uh, so basically gRPC is uh, not like a it's not by default uh, has uh, speed advantage over rest but it provides something uh, some tool or mechanism uh, wh what it ma uh, which makes uh, that is more faster uh, as compared to rest like selective message compression so if we're calling some api and want some data from that we can compress that data and send it via uh, from that uh, flow like we don't have to, we don't want uh, we want da data to uh, i mean in our system right we don't uh, it can be compressed in between so that support is there in gRPC, uh, load balancing and all. Uh, even, even when we uh, hit an API, we can pass some flags. In REST, we can't do that. We cannot pass some flag like compress the data or something like that. But gRPC does it. Uh, also like what gRPC stands for, RPC is remote procedure call, and G is not for Google. So it's like whenever they rele release it, they name it like great RPC, good RPC. Uh, so like that, the name is that, uh, they did like that. So. Yeah, I mean, so um, we know, right, um, gRPC is not for everything. Like, uh, we need REST support and all, and uh, like some, uh, for some, uh, some uh, use cases. So, uh, so we have a plugin called gRPC Gateway. So what it does is, like, it takes um, REST, uh, for, uh, REST services and convert to gRPC and vice versa. Even gRPC services can be converted to REST. So that, uh, that thing uh, it does. So it's a plugin from uh, Google Protocol Buffer Compiler called ProTalk. So it's just like, a, uh, we, that is also like a tool or something. So it converts our REST to gRPC and gRPC to uh, REST. And how it does is like, uh, it, it follows a rule called Google API HTTP. So we have a rule uh, from Google like, that is called HTTP uh, mapping rules. So how these services are mapped and all those stuff so it is done through this uh, Google API HTTP uh, annotations. Uh, so yeah, I mean, in a nutshell, it's a plugin of um, Protobuf compiler, which generates proxy code from Protobuf. So I mean, Protobuf is a data format which serializes and deserializes data, like what we have is JSON. So JSON is a one, Avro is a one, Protobuf is a one. So uh, we can use JSON also. We can write our services in JSON and uh, use gRPC, uh, gateway gRPC. And uh, yeah, translates HTTP JSON call to gRPC and vice versa. And and this translation happen in two ways, like uh, in process translation, and one other is like uh, using um, I mean separate proxy server. So we use a server to do uh, multiple uh, transition uh, translation at the same time. So in in process tran translation, we uh, we can only have a one uh, unary uh, gRPC. That means like one request, one response type stuff. We cannot have multiple requests and responses. And you know, right, why we are we wanted multiple request response stuff? Because I mean, today is a world of microservices. We want to handle loads and all those stuff. We don't want uh, our things to get, um, I mean, it should be available at the same time. Uh, so we want something faster way, multiple request response uh, stuff. So basically load balancing. So what that gRPC has uh, supports. Uh, so yeah, I mean, 
this is a by uh, I mean this is a uh, diagram how uh, this gRPC gateway works but I create a re, uh, re create a new diagram called this one so when you see um, so this is a, we write a service in protobuf we can see here and this is a client uh, gRPC cli uh, rest client and this is a uh, gRPC client so what it does when we uh, okay yeah, so basically we uh, write, uh, do the request, and we got a response using a gateway. So it's uh, create a reverse proxy here. You can see the gateway. This gateway only does the work, converting the rest to gRPC and vice versa. And yeah, I mean, I cannot show the code here. So basically how we write this thing. So uh, how we simple uh, server we write, like write a client, write a server. And accordingly, we uh, write APIs and all in rest. Same way in gRPC also we do that. We write our services in protobuf and uh, use protoc to compile those, uh, sur uh, I mean, compile the sur services and con that converts uh, some other codes, all stuffs, and we use accordingly in our uh, client server. Mm, I mean, you can see the uh, references, the doc site, and also the repository. So when you see, uh, you can go through this repository I created uh, uh, to follow how we can write our uh, gRPC services. Uh, okay, so. Uh, yeah, thank you uh, for listening to me. And you can follow me on here, like uh, LinkedIn, GitHub, and all. And yeah, thank you so much. Okay. Thanks for the for your talk. So unfortunately, we have uh, no <laughs> speakers are coming. So unfortunately. Yeah, uh, probably not make it, but I will take over the floor, <laughs> as always. I think last year also I did the same thing, so let me set up for my first. No worries. It will be a quick one, so not to worry if you are sleepy or handy or... I'm not sure what you're doing, but it will be a quick one, so don't worry. Is it different? Okay. All right. So this is this is for my slide. I think this is just to uh, compensate uh, on time that the speaker is not, uh, not appearing for today's uh, session. So I will end the session for today. So uh, this is for my, this is my quick slide. Uh, building openness uh, in you. I think some of people already know this slide, so don't uh, anticipate first. So. Basically, uh, who I am, uh, my name is Shazwan, so I'm from Malaysia, and this is my background, back on the ground. Uh, but then, I am an IT person, I'm doing sysadmin, basically I'm doing servers mostly, and yeah, as you can see, this is my server, not not mine, not mine now, but this is all, uh, this is my server that I maintain now. So this is my, some of my, my history that you can read. Mostly I'm doing with Ubuntu, but uh, recently, uh, I think for the past three years, I've been, act, I've been uh, active with Genome also. So, uh, just to make it simple, uh, on, 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 on my talk, I want to talk about open source. So I think Justin already uh, explained this uh, on, uh, on a while. It's more, if, if we talk about open source, it's more or less like mambo jumbo word. It's just like uh, something that marketing guys do. It's an open source. It's open source, that's all. Nothing on, nothing on. But then, uh, one thing we have to understand, open source is not about, uh, it's, open source is it's not just about codes, it's not about uh, movement, it's about, op it's about options. So you have option to go, whether going to this kind of project or that kind of project, you want to contribute, you want to use it, it's up to you. Just like what this guy said, uh, I'm not sure if you guys can see what he's talking about. Uh, yeah, while corporation dominates society and rights, the law, each advance in technology is opening for them to further restrict the users. So this is what 
open source really meant to do. It's not real. It's not really just make a system more uh, restrictive for the user, and also I think it's for the technology itself. So, what is really restrictive for the user? For me, this is the main. Oh wait, wait, it's coming. Okay, so this is the main thing about open source. It's more about knowledge. So open source is not just about technology. It's about learning. So you learn, you are learning new new language. You are learning new stuff. You are learning new guys, new friends uh, around the world. Uh, so yeah, like uh, this guy is talking. So yeah, it's un uh, unrestricted access uh, to knowledge, uh, unplanned, unhibited association. Man, uh, yeah, 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 you can read it, read it on the screen. So yeah, uh, knowledge is not uh, open source. is not about it's not about just technology. It's about knowledge. Uh, it's make us less talk about uh, talk like duck and chicken. Sometimes you talk about HTTP, uh, HTML, and then this guy talk about JavaScript, and then this guy talk about C++ and and all. Uh, you can it, it's not interoperable uh, interoperable uh, working on yeah uh, on on, the, on 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 what you are understand. Same goes like when you are develop develop an uh, extension for genome. You kind of like uh, you can make an app. You can you can make an complete complete app on genome. But why do you just do an extension? It's just an option. Not it's not about uh, it's not about do a big stuff. It's not about uh, small stuff. It's just contributing and also make things fun. So I guess why not we share our knowledge? That's the thing. That's what what, what that's what what open source is about. But then. Uh, Open source is not just mainly about uh, uh, tech, uh, uh, about uh, about knowledge. For me, like Justin already emphasized on the, uh, on morning, the real gem is the community itself. So community is one uh, thing that people are used used to think it's. I I can say it's more or less care than the code itself. So for me, the one uh, the. Uh, the people that make the uh, that create or run the technology is the is the uh, people and people is the community. This is what uh, happened with uh, with uh, with uh, my experience with the community. This is uh, back in 2020 in Malaysia Open Source Conference, and this is our meetup with our team uh, going to Fedora Fatcon uh, in Pune. Uh, I can't remember which year, which uh, which which year. 2012. So, this is the real gem in our community. This is real gem in uh, the open source world. So, yeah, it's not about it's not about it's not about technically codes. It's about friendship, and like I said, friendship does benefit in everything. Maybe you can learn something you don't know. Maybe you can learn. You 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 know the, the uh, you know the knowledge, but you can learn more on uh, on understanding more on the technology. Even for me, uh, I I learn stuff from uh, more genome stuff from Matthias' uh, talk. Even though I'm not asking the question, but from this presentation, I do learn. I'm more I'm more engaged on uh, how genome works, on how the uh, I mean last talk uh, last year talk uh, he talked about. Uh, creating fonts in care in Malaysia. So yeah, it's. A, I'm not doing. I, I, I'm. 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 Uh, to be. To be. Uh, to to let you know, I'm not a designer. I'm not a, a, a programmer. But I do learn on how uh, those stuff works, and we can appreciate uh, the people that contributing. Uh, either not just not just font, but how the system works. Okay, so. Uh, basically, what I do with open source. So, uh, uh, number one, hack it, not hacking, hack it. So maybe you can just try it, you test it, you don't, you love it, or you hate it. I'm not sure. Uh, I also gaming on Linux. This is back on. I, I can't remember. This is 2009, 2010. This is old, old stuff uh, before Proton uh, even exists. And also, I do contribute for my local team. This is when I'm uh, designing logo for the Malaysia Open Source Conference. And also, like I said, I'm hack. I'm hack lot. I'm hack lot. So not just computer, but on a mobile. This is uh, N900. If you, uh, if I, I'm not sure if youngsters know. N900. N900 was a cool device that ever exists. Not full stop. 
And this is my first conference that I attending because, like I said, uh, uh, to be to contribute is not just to to do talk, but to attend. So you are do, you are doing part of uh, you are actually indirectly contributing part of uh, contribution you know, in 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 community. So uh, for my experience, once you already come, you learn you learn more, you uh, adapt more, and you will appreciate more. Probably, probably on 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 next event. I'm I'm not sure. Uh, if local team, probably I don't know. Local team want to do a small event. Probably you you are interested to learn more. Then you can involve more. Yeah, the more the merrier. And then this is the first uh event that I contribute. Uh, like I said, first I attend and then I uh organize with the with the team. So this is back in 2010. And also it's not just doing uh, we uh, it doesn't mean uh contribute locally. You can also uh contribute uh contribute uh globally without even attending it like what I did in 2012 I think is it? Yeah, 2010. Sorry, 2010. This is uh, just a simple project. Just translate. I just do translation on this main, main, uh, Ubuntu manual. But unfortunately, the project is already dead. So, uh, 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 so it's kind of useless. You want to look uh, for the project. But this is one of the project that I I, I participating. This is a global project. Just do, basically, just translate. It's not even coding. So. It do just do part. This is my. I think this is my part of uh, contrib uh, contribution because, uh, uh probably in the Nepal team uh, can provide uh, probably translation like 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 I think I think Mr Adika uh, presentation. Why don't translate uh, to your language because it's not really because from my perspective, uh, language is barrier sometimes for for this for Asia especially because. Not everyone is understanding uh, English very well. Uh, unlike in Malaysia, we kind uh, probably most most common language is uh, English in IT. So I'm not sure here, but unlike for example in Indonesia, uh, they have uh, kind of like barrier to get into to the local because it's hard to understand because of English. Because over there, it's all. Uh, I think most of them are, are only local speaking, uh, local speakers. So. Why don't contribute to just do translation easier? So, what should you do? Never reinvent the wheel. Never reinvent the wheel. Try to take another project. I, I mean, there's a lot of open source projects that are running now. So why don't why don't you take uh, the essence of project? Maybe for example, like I, I I'm uh, I'm not really kind of like. I'm not really uh, into the project uh, recently, but uh, like previously, when uh, when genome uh, moving sh shift to uh, genome shell, which is back in uh, I think genome three from genome gen uh, genome two, genome two is kind of like uh, bread and butter in in Linux community. So po most of people are not really okay with what genome uh, are trying to do with genome shell or genome three at the time, and I'm. The one who also kind of like hesitant to upgrade to genome three, unlike today, which is obviously I'm using uh, the latest genome. So why don't why don't we, we uh, probably take the, the the existed project and make it uh, uh, make it better, make it uh, uh, I think I think uh, the the short word is improve it. Uh, so that's 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 probably probably the 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 the, the the best word. So never reinvent the wheel. Never just do it from fresh. It's time consuming. So there's a lot of project that you, that we can we can we can take it. And also never work on silo because we never do a, a, a silo project. Never done. I mean, I mean never complete. I can say never complete. So try to collaborate. Uh, like what Matthias did uh, explain uh, on the last event. He not he he actually he he actually he 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 only do do coding not uh, doing uh, font but he uh, looking for someone he can who can contribute on doing font and also like uh, I I think I I can't remember uh, there's another speaker previously he also not doing uh, he only do design but don't know how to uh, to do coding but he just submit design like logo. Probably some like if if genome wants a wallpaper, you can contribute. It's not even a code, so never work never work on silo. Ask our community if they can contribute at least, uh, because one thing is 
uh, putting uh, open source project down is asking because we are like we are we just think our project is good our project is better than other because we are doing do we are we, we just do uh, in our group no best project is do collab is to collaborate you have to you, if you want to go big you have to collaborate even in big corporation also we have to do cooperation and also i think if once you already work once you never work in silo you will in, you will uh, learn something new every day okay so i think it's already i don't know it's 5 minutes or passing already so i just want to share i just want to share my last uh, my last slide so this is okay uh, this is my I, I think you know the, the, the left fella already. Yeah, I met him. I met him, <laughs> obviously. So uh, I just I, I don't want to introduce uh, uh, Stormen uh, for you guys, but I want to introduce uh, the, the guy in, in the middle. He's actually a, a friend of mine, uh, and he the one who introduced me the real open source uh, world to me. This is why reason why I, I, I'm here. I'm attending here. I'm with you guys and also I helping the local local guys uh, uh, in in a way I mean I, I'm not a developer I'm just do what I do I love spread the love okay so he shared this mantra to me and probably this mantra quite can be uh, an eye opener for you guys so this is the mantra information is free you have to know but people are not you have to pay still contributors are priceless you have to be all right, so thank you. Uh, you want to close? Okay. Um, so we have freedom as well. He's going to, he can talk. Okay. Yeah, he's connecting online so he can talk. All right, talk. so. So we have the other speaker that we couldn't connect to. Maggie. Freedom. Woohoo. <laughs> awesome. So we are going to just need one minute since he's online and we just need to set up. So just guess a few seconds. Maximum one minute and we'll be here. Track one. Track one. Mm -hmm. You have sent me the credentials.
So, Rhythm, can you try to talk? Hello, I'm Olivia. We can hear you. Can you try again? Hello. Okay. okay. Perfect. Hmm. I'm sharing my screen, I guess, uh, it's visible. I'm sharing my camera as well. So let's start. So today I'm going to be talking about the closing credits clip generator. This was the GSOC project that I did this summer and it was under a pit P. We can move to the next slide. Yeah. So uh, we're going to be dividing into four parts. First is the problem statement, then the approach overview the challenges faced and the expressing gratitude. Continuing with the problem statement that we had right now. So we had to develop a feature that basically provides the users the ability so that they can create and craft a, a, a closing credit clips according to their own perspective, wherever they want to place it, at what pace they want to uh, make that text scroll over the screen and the content of the clip. And they can correspondingly add it, add it to their edited video. So that was a problem statement at hand. So let's look at the approach that we uh, pursued. Going towards the approach overview, there were four major parts that I would like to divide this entire project into. First is integrating the WP plugin, then customizing closing credits clips, bringing HTML to life, that is making video files out of that HTML, and then updating the clip. So let's uh, deep diaper into that. First is integrating the WP plugin. Why we selected the WP plugin? So WP plugin basically allows us to generate video out of the HTML file. And as you know, with the HTML file, we can add a JavaScript to it. Using the JavaScript, we can create a variety of animations. We can make the text scroll over the entire screen. We can place it at different places. And once that HTML file is created, using the WP plugin, you can convert that HTML file and make a uh, and, and make a video file, uh, the MP4 and any uh, type you want to, we can make a video file out of it. So this was the major part of the project that we had. First was integrating the WP plugin into the PitP. Going forward, the second was customizing the closing credit script. As I mentioned in the problem statement itself, the task was to make sure that the users are able to edit and customize the text they want to display on the in the closing credit clips and how they want to place it. So as you can see in the picture right uh, on the right hand side, here at the top, you can customize the text that you want to display in the closing credit clip. It is in the form of HTML format and it is by default. This, uh, this column is by default populated with a default text so that users can know what to enter and which format they want to enter into the closing credit clip. At the bottom, you can see a drop down that basically currently there are three options, center, left and right. And this is how, this is where the text will be displayed on the screen itself in the clip. Yeah. Going towards the third part that is now converting, now making a video file out of that, out of that HTML. So this can be further divided into three steps. First was in the HTML file, we have an HTML file. I need to update the content that is present in the HTML file according to what user entered in the text box that I represented in the last slide. Then using that HTML file, I'll make use of WP video source element that is provided by the WP plugin itself. Using that, I'll create a pipeline and create a video file out of it. So now I have a video file, say for example, MP4 file that is stored at a location. Now I need to auto automate so that the generated MP4 file, that is the output file, closing credit file that can be is imported into the project by itself. So three parts were there. Now going forward, the fourth uh, part of the analysis was how to edit the clip. So if a user has already created a closing credit clip, now they should also have an option to edit the clip, maybe alter the text and alter the location that they want to. It's not, it shouldn't be necessary for a user to generate a new clip altogether. So for that, we have an edit clip option. What it does it edit clip option again opens a text box that I represented in the second slide. In that you can enter the text that you want to and the drop down you want to. According to that, it will take those values, generate a new HTML file, 
basically update the existing HTML file, generate a new output that is the video clip file, and then import it accordingly to the project itself. One of the major challenges I'll cover later on. So this was the four parts that we could see. First is WP plugin, then customizing the text, then making some changes, creating a video file out of it, and then providing an option to update the clip that we have generated. I would certainly like to talk about the challenges that I faced during this journey. There are a bunch of them, but few highlighted one are first just integrating the WP plugin to Bitfi that took around a month. It was majorly because WP plugin had its own issues at that point, And those were to be resolved before it can be imported into the Bitfi project. So that means having a conversation with the other teams and making sure that WP plugin is working and installing it take a lot of time into the Bitfi project. Second was to make sure that the current workflow of importing and creating a closing credit clip is very convenient for a, from a user perspective. So if I tell you, you just need to click on a button that will uh, create a pop-up that uh, in which you will enter the text you want to display on the closing credit clip. After that, everything will be taken care of, file will be generated, it will be imported into the project itself and you can easily drag it to the timeline in the pit view only. So you don't have to make a lot of efforts or go out of the way to make sure that you're generating a closing credit clip. Apart from that, even editing is also comfortable. If you edit it on at the back itself, it will update the HTML file, will create a new file, import the video file into the project itself, and then automatically add it to the timeline as well, where you were already having an existing closing credit clip. So just to make sure that this workflow is completely uh, completely seamless and user doesn't have to face any external issues uh, that took a bunch of time and the third is the general whenever you uh, whenever you uh, do an open source code uh, contribution you need to make sure that the existing uh, coding style and and, re and the code is readable and all the uniformity is there so these were the three challenges that were covered by me um, during the entire project and entire journey and Going to the next, uh, next slide, I will just like to thank my mentors and they were there almost at every point of my journey and whatever I had, I faced during this journey, I was able, I was easily able to talk to them and resolve that out. So that easy, easy communication and that uh, frank conversation with them really made my experience very enriching and I totally loved it. This is my first open source contribution and I totally loved it and looking forward for more contributions and you know. Going ahead. Thank you so much for ending the conference. And if you have any questions, please let me know. No questions? So going forward, I have added a few of the links, merge request link, blog post link, and the GSOC project link. You can go through the all the links and let me know if you have any queries, you want to have any discussion. I'm always available. You can reach out to me. I have my email ID and LinkedIn ID here. That's uh, that's it from my end. Any Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, thank you, Rhythm. So, are there any questions from the people who are attending in presence? No, so far no questions. Thank you very much for the presentation. Another applause. Um, at this point, probably we should ask the, the ladies, the girls from the local team who were um, introducing, presenting, if they would like to do the closing of the event. I'm not seeing them. <laughs> I know that now we have uh, the Fedora party, so Justin, if you'd like to make a little invitation for everyone who is attending here. So thanks everyone for hanging on after a pretty long day. We had a lot of great content and speakers, so we just give a round of applause for all the speakers today. And 
So now that we've made it to the end in the evening, we've got one more surprise coming for you soon. We've got some cake coming to do a celebration for the Fedora project. We're celebrating the Fedora 20th anniversary this year, as well as our Fedora Linux 39 release that just came out just a few weeks ago. Uh, so while we wait for the cake to arrive, we're going to have, uh, actually if I could ask all the Fedora folks to come up to the front so folks can see you and you can be a friendly face up here if you wouldn't mind coming up to some of the front tables. Um, so how this is going to go, we're going to have the cake come up in a little bit. We also are going to have different, uh, while you are eating the cake, we'll have some different, uh, some of our Fedora folks will be talking, like lightning talks, about the Fedora community, things that you can do and participate with and kind of an overview of what all is going on in the Fedora project. Um, so I think what I'll probably start with is maybe do brief introductions with all of our Fedora uh, team that's here at GNOME Asia, and then we'll, we'll go from there, depending until once the cake arrives. Actually, yeah, we can have all the folks come up on stage first, and then we'll... Uh, well, I, I can do an intro. I, I was already on stage this morning. I think most folks might have seen that already, but as a reminder, my name is Justin. Uh, I'm the Fedora community architect. I work at Red Hat, uh, working full-time on, on Fedora. Uh, I do a lot of work around our events and doing work in the community, and I was a community contributor. This is my going on nine years in the Fedora project, and I've been at Red Hat for about one. Uh, why don't we have all the, come on up onto the main stage here. I'll, Come on up, all of you, come on, come on, come on, come on. <laughs> you too, come on. <laughs> on the way, perfect. So we can just do uh, your name, your background, also where you're from. I'm, I'm from the southeast of the United States. And uh, how long you've been in Fedora and what you're up to in the Fedora community. Right, so uh, I'm Agash Deepthar. I have been a part of the Fedora project since yeah, nearly about five years now. Uh, my day job is uh, I work in the Red Hat community platform engineering team working on Fedora, so I treat myself really lucky because you know I get to work on free and open source full time. I'm from Pune, India, and uh, the stuff that I'm up to these days, I don't know, building projects, maintaining stuff for Fedora. Over to you, Sumantro. Hey, I'm Shumantro. I hail from Kolkata, India, and um, I have been working on this thing called Fedora Quality. Uh, we will, you will hear a lot about it today. I also work on this team called Toolbox. Like I usually go ahead and test it. We we'll anyway talk more about it. And other than that, uh, yeah, I'm just mentoring folks around. So if you are interested in Fedora QA, reach out to me. Hi, this is Amita Sharma, and I'm from Pune, India. Uh, my day job is totally different. I'm a quality engineering manager for OpenShift AI in Red Hat. Uh, but I started my journey with uh, testing. Uh, he hired me in the Red Hat. <laughs> and since then, I have been um, contributing to Fedora QA. After that, I moved to DEI team, which was established eight years ago. And my main focus now is to contribute in the Fedora DEI team. So that you will hear about it a lot from me um, during the release party. I would love to share all the work this awesome team is doing. So I hope you will stay here for the DEI content and also for the cake. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. I'm Nikita Tripathi. And I first got involved with Fedora uh, in my 2022 summer internship as an outreach intern for the Fedora Badges project. Uh, and uh, ever since that, uh, I've been contributing whenever I get time because right now I'm a student. So uh, recently, I contributed to the Free Tower, which is a initiative of Creative Freedom Summit, which is going to happen in January. And uh, yeah, I contribute now and then. Hello, namaste everyone. So I am Samyak Jain. I am from Delhi, India. And I am currently working as a Fedora release engineer. So yes, I have something to do with Fedora releasing. And uh, I am involved in open source, as like I said, for five years. I was working with Debian for my GSOC. And then I currently switched to Fedora and working with Red Hat. So this is me. Thank you. 
Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Sudhir Dharanendraya. I'm from Bangalore and from Red Hat. And um, it's really lovely to be here. And uh, I think I can take all the time till the cake comes, right? Why, I'm just kidding. Um, so I've been with Red Hat for 14 and a half years. And uh, I think I started sort of getting involved myself with Fedora probably during Fedora Core 3. Um, that was just before Red Hat, I think. So. Um, yeah, it's been a long journey, and uh, it's lovely to be here. I think we're all excited for the cake and the release and the 20-year celebration. But we'll, we'll talk more, so I don't, I don't want to take up more time. But meanwhile, if you folks have anything for us, I think we'll be all ears to hear about it. And uh, Justin, it's your turn. Thank you, folks. <laughs> Sorry. So while we're waiting for the cake, uh, we will... <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we got a lot of folks here. So while we're waiting, I don't think. Uh, I think we can just start talking about it. And then, I mean, like more, it's more like a discussion than uh, a talk. Yeah, I was thinking about maybe we could do like a little icebreaker activity. Do like a. Yeah. So yeah. what I was thinking is we can have everyone stand up. This is a common thing at conferences that I've been to, is it's uh, sometimes that people call it speed dating. But everyone will stand up in a line, two lines facing each other. And everyone will go around in a circle, and you can usually what we'll, we could say is like your name, where you came from, and something you learned today at the conference. And I think that might be a way to uh, get to know some of your fellow attendees here, as well as the other speakers. And uh, I think by the time we finish that, we'll have some yummy cake to, uh, to cut and eat yeah. as well. And, and I have the mic to go around. You know, I have yeah. a free ticket. <laughs> Yeah, so why don't, why don't we do it that way? It'll probably be easier than moving everything around. All right, so why don't we do it that way? Let's go around the room, and everyone will just do a quick intro to get to know folks. Again, name, where you're from, and something you learned today from the conference. It's like, it's like putting pressure back onto your people. <laughs> like, what is it to be like standing here and then talking? Right, so now you have the mic. Go ahead. Uh, I'm Siddhartha Zitrola. Uh, I, I am in the organizing uh, uh, team for the Gnome Asia Swami 223, and I am uh, from Kathmandu, and I am uh, currently a software developer. Uh. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, I am Aditya. Uh, I am the current uh, like Nepal team lead. So I am also a s software developer, uh, Python developer, and I am a student, uh, third year bachelor's. And yeah, it has quite been like very good experience for us. Like to have this event, this conference in Nepal was like uh, putting in the seed uh, for like open source culture in the Nepal. And we want to like make a beautiful tree from it. So yeah, uh, I think everyone will support um, for beautiful cause. Uh, thank you. Hello, namaste. Uh, this is me, Hempal Shreshta. Uh, I am a member of uh, Free and Open Source community. Uh, pretty long. I'll be talking a little more about it tomorrow. Uh, what I learned is, you know, the very first presentation that you gave is, you know, open source is about, about method, it's about collaboration, and it's about culture, I guess, you know. So how deep we go, I think that's really important. Hello everyone, this is Bhavna and currently I'm working as a C++ developer un under a US-based startup named Monado XR. And apart from that, I'm also a third year student uh, in Delhi University. And I'm, current, I'm from Delhi, India itself. And I'm a little bit active in open source, being part of different programs like uh, LFX Mentorship and the Harbor Project and XROS Fellowship, MLH Fellowship and a lot more. And after this after party, I'm looking to explore Fedora pro open source project and looking to contribute there as well. Yeah, thank you. Hey, hello, everyone. Uh, so this is Rajiv. I'm from Bangalore, India. I work for Epimora Mars as software engineer. And this is the first time I spoke uh, in a conference. So I offline, online I gave. So it was a great learning experience for me. And also, like, uh, thank you for G uh, Genome and uh, people from Kathmandu and uh, organizing this event. It was a great learning experience. I can't express, yeah. Thank you. So hello, everyone. My name is Adin Kaushik. I guess some of you would now know me because I had a talk today. But in short, I am from Delhi, India. I am the lead of Gnome Jesus Group in Delhi, India region. 
and I was a GSOC student as well at GNOME and Google Chromium, and I'm currently a software developer, part-time software developer, and a pre-final year student in VTEC CS. And uh, yeah, the things I've learned is more about open source and the uh, CLA chat we had in the hallway, that was great. And uh, more about GNOME extensions for myself and Posh and GRPC. So it was just a great day and looking forward to more. Yeah. I think as we go back, they are supposed to sing, right? <laughs> uh, hello, everyone. This is Bishan, Bishan Kathioda. And Hello. 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 So for the past uh, five to six years, I've been Udo developer. And uh, honestly speaking, I haven't been a con contributor in the open source community, but I'm surely intending to do so from now onward. Thank you. Hello, I am Subham Gautam. I am from Pokhara and currently I am in 7th semester of uh, software engineering at GCS College. Thank you. Hello. Good evening everyone. Uh, I am Sumiran Dal from Eastern Nepal, Japa. Uh, I am pursuing CS at second year. Uh, today I learned more about open source, uh, GNOME and the uh, Linux community uh, to build ourselves uh, to grow more I created more networks to introduce with more people and know about the power of open source yeah go open source uh, hi everyone this is Sudhi Bogarty from Kathmandu and I'm from Kathmandu yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh, so sorry. Um, I am currently pursuing my graduation BIT at Omri Science Campus, and it has it had been a good, great season about open source and Chrome. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Namaste. Uh, I am Om Pragas Sharma, and uh, I am a computer engineering student at Thapathali Campus in Kathmandu. Uh, uh, this session was very much great and I learned a lot of things about open source and how can we take this uh, open source spirit back to our community. So yeah, it was a great event and thank you all the speakers, organizers uh, for this wonderful event. Thank you. So hello everyone, I'm Maspinosti. I'm currently a final year ID student, pursuing my ID from Chidwan and I'm a uh, FSS enthusiast, I'm fan of all things decentralized and open source. Uh, I currently work part-time at a blockchain firm. I'm not too proud of it, but it gets me some money, so that's it. <laughs> and I did make some connections today, uh, great connections. I learned a lot from some of the sessions, uh, and especially the session with, uh, I think it was, how does GNOME work? The visualization from the PS3, that really uh, put some insights into me, and. I'm quite proud of it, so, okay, that's what I learned, thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Asok Sapkara from Chitown, currently studying at Software Erika College, B.Sc. Arms Computing, and uh, uh, personally, I'm not an open source contributor, but from today's session, the I'm very enthusiastic to contribute m to open source, to learn more about open source, and that was the thing I learned today, thank you. <coughs> Hello, my name is Ankur Rajkarna. I'm currently working as a DevOps engineer in Young Innovations uh, company here in Nepal. Uh, I learned many great things today. How to create a community, how to contribute uh, in the open source community. Because uh, in our company, we, we are working on an open source product. But we uh, do not directly contribute to the Linux Foundation or anything uh, revolving it. So I learned something today how to cont uh, contribute to the office stream projects or um, uh, revolving around thing, projects uh, revolving around it. Thank you. Hello, my name is Oscar Rajgiri. 
आई एम करेंटली स्टडिंग इन सॉफ्टवेयर का कंप्यूटिंग साइंस आई हैव टुडे आई हैव लर्न अबाउट द ओपन सोर्स एंड आल्सो अबाउट द फ्लैट पैक अबाउट द फ्लैट पैक थैंक यू हेलो एवरीवन आई एम करुण दीक्षित एंड आई एम फ्रॉम काठमांडू एंड आई एम करेंटली स्टडिंग एट सॉफ्टवेयर का एज अ सेकेंड ईयर एंड टुडे आई लर्न अ लॉट अबाउट ओपन सोर्स अबाउट वाट इट इज एंड हाउ वी कैन यूज इट थैंक यू Hello, my name is Ritham Trista. I am currently an undergrad student at uh, in my third year. I am current. I am a volunteer at, at this event, Noam Asia, and I am currently a software developer at Ezo Nepal. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I am Saurav Thakur. I am currently a software engineer at Sangrila Microsystems, and I am also a member of the organizing committee here, uh, working locally to organize this event. Uh, it has been a great honor to work. alongside my fellow colleagues and to meet these people uh, i would like to thank uh, the genome foundation for this opportunity thank you all right hi everyone my name is yush pokhrel um yet another computer science students um something being very honest i wasn't really into open source or any tech field actually i just joined computer to study computer engineering just for the sake of it but eventually so far even in my journey of computer engineering Uh, something that I've met is like-minded people that are in engineering, are do want to contribute to this field, and that have pushed me. And this was another conference that actually helped me push over that edge of actually wanting to contribute to something bigger. And I think that's my biggest learning: meeting new people that actually pushed me to actually contribute to something that I wasn't originally interested in, was just learning for the sake of it. So this is a great conference for me. Hello everyone. My name is Vijay Squirala and I'm a software developer at Sangrila Microsystems and I'm currently studying bachelor's in CSIT in Orchid College and this has been a great opportunity. Thank you. Hello everyone. It's me Usha Batrai. Uh, I am from Butol and I am a full stack developer and open source co contributor. Thank you. Hi, I am Sirpa Ada. I am currently an undergraduate student studying a uh, bachelor's in information management, and I participated as a volunteer for this summit. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Shaili Manander. I'm from Kathmandu, and I'm currently a undergraduate student, and I participated as a volunteer for this event. Thank you. Hello everyone. I am Akriti Das, a web developer intern, and currently I am computer engineering fifth semester student. Thank you. Hello everyone. I am Abhijit Sagewali, a uh, third year computer, computer science student at Madan Madari Memorial College. Thank you. Hi, my name is Gautam, and I am um, a JSOC student this year in Ganom. in ganom control center and also i am working on fos with suraj uh, developing a fos cell for mobile linux thank you hello i am andika actually i am it security consultant daily but my hobby is <laughs> translating so I, i i help gnome to translate to indonesia i help libre office I am a library translator in Indonesia. Indonesian translator. I also translate significant part of Fedora into Indonesian. But lately, I don't know if I can help more because I, and and it it discuss something with with uh, Fedora people that know what's what's going on behind the scenes. If if I can if I, I if I. uh maybe maybe uh, after that i i can decide if i want to continue contribute translation or not hopefully we we can have some discussion okay thank you hello everyone uh, my name is irfan uh, currently i work at btech as a product development so uh, i am a force enthusiast uh, find interesting from in uh, into Kath uh, kathmandu uh, i feel Uh, environment is different from uh, uh, Indonesia, so the younger generation uh, have a, 
uh, more knowledge and uh, new spirit if I uh, feel it. Okay, thank you. Hello, I'm a, uh, hello everyone. I'm Bayu. I'm uh, inkscaper for 13 years, maybe. <laughs> so basically, I'm a graphic designer. Uh, I use free software, but uh, it does mean that I always do design for free, right? So uh, uh, from today, I learned a lot that uh, generally, I, I still need to learn a lot about many things in open source, and uh, there is one word I learned uh, lately about that, that will be my comment about uh, Genome ICA Summit 2023, uh, Rambruch. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, so, hi, everyone. I'm Suraj Utrai. So, I'm the final year engineering student from the run. And I joined this event all the way from the run because I'm so much interested into open source and I have been recently advocating for the LibreOffice project. Uh, and I'm also a liaison for this Nepal country, or I can say that I am a liaison for the LibreOffice community and I have been managing local activities here in Nepal. And recently we have been doing a lot of things into localization and a bit of different uh, kind of taste of uh, sessions and workshop as well, thanks. Hi, I'm Spandan Gurarai. Basically, I'm a nerd, and <laughs> so I'm very much interested in forth. And I'm a computer engineering student in Dharan, and I traveled from Dharan to here to just for this event, and it was nice experiencing the fastest stuff from a closer perspective. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Suraj. I work as a software engineer. Uh, apart from that, in 2021, I did GSOC under KDE. So that's a controversial thing right there. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rosanna Yoon. I live in the west coast of the US. Um, and what I learned today, I learned, um, I've had lots of people come up to me and talk to me about DEI stuff, which is really exciting because I'm looking forward to doing more about that in, in the GNOME community, so. Hello everyone, I'm Surab Shrestha, currently studying computer engineering at Pulcho campus in uh, sixth semester, thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Sushil Thapa. I'm currently studying computer engineering in Pulcho campus. Uh, hello, uh, namaste everyone. Uh, my name is Budaram Gurung, and I would like to especially thank the uh, Ganam community to help me meet my ex-colleagues <laughs> from Red Hat. And uh, I think only in conferences we meet uh, these things. And uh, yeah, and about today's uh, event, um, I think there are a lot more to share. But uh, I think the community is all about this. So people meet, and then they share a lot of things, not just technical, uh, non-technical, and then Obviously, that uh, there are careers pro uh, prospect as well, and uh, yeah, and I'm doing a lot of things uh, actually here in Nepal. I don't know, but uh, uh, Dhanusar is my brand name, <laughs> so I'm like trainer, uh, mentor, and uh, I'm entrepreneur as well. So if you are like uh, into like you want to get uh, you know place in some company, so uh, and you're having difficulty, then you can reach me out. I am actually doing that job uh, in Nepal. And uh, yeah, um, recently I started something uh, uh, like Code Plan, which will basically, you know, uh, more like community plus uh, like uh, placement, training, everything is there. Like so, so yeah, for those students who are fa feeling facing difficulty in you know training uh, or like learning or getting job, you know the you know system here, job system. So I'm creating the whole pipeline of you know placement, all those things. So. If you have facing difficulty or your friends, then let me know. Um, I will definitely help, you know, uh, to you know get placed in some company. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Federico Mena. I'm I come from Mexico. I work for SUSE uh, on maintaining Libre SVG and on cleaning up accessibility code. Uh, what? Oh, uh, I'm I'm one of the founders. 
Yeah, that's that's hard to follow. Um, hi, <laughs> I'm I'm Matthias. <laughs> I'm from Germany, um, but I live on the uh, east coast of the United States in New England. Uh, and last, like most people up on stage here, I work at Red Hat, and I have also been using Fedora since Fedora Core One, I believe, or so. so. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Cairo Isaac, but you can call me uh, Fenris. So I'm one of the uh, GNOME Foundation members and uh, one of the uh, Ubuntu membership boards. So I think I'm I'm also uh, one of the double agent today. Means like <laughs> <laughs> because like uh, one I'm the organizer team and another one is like I'm being a speaker for tomorrow. And uh, what I've learned today means like I th actually I think I'm expanding my networking, meeting with Justin, meeting with the one of the founder of uh, GNOMES and meeting with the uh, local India um, Indians uh, communities and Nepalese community as well. Yeah, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Anissa. I'm from Albania. I live in Italy. I'm a GNOME Foundation member and part of the Code of Conduct Committee. Um, I, I contribute also to OpenStreetMap and Wikimedia projects. <laughs> and well, one thing that I learned today, I learned a lot of things in general, but something that I'm ha most happy that I got to know is the, the amazing local team who has done an amazing job to, to organize this event. Am I need to introduce myself? <laughs> Am I? No need. No. Okay. My name is Jaswan. I'm from Malaysia. Um, basically, I'm working. Uh, I'm working by myself. Uh, actually, I'm actually uh, working by myself. I'm actually ten, uh, the role call uh, consultant consul, uh, consul, consultant for open source technology. Anything related to uh, open source because I'm dealing everything in Linux. Uh, yeah, everything. So. Uh, I'm also a Genome Foundation member and also part of uh, the Genome Asia Committee. And also, I'm also helping for the local team to organize this uh, event. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think I'm happy with. Uh, I'm happy. Uh, we ca I can say I'm happy with the overall uh, today events. And yeah, more ha more happy seeing all of you guys here. So clap for you guys. Uh, sorry, I forgot. I'm also from uh, Malaysia. I don't know him. Hi, I'm Jens Friedersen. I work at Red Hat in Singapore. Uh, what I learned today is, uh, yeah, I'm really surprised how much enthusiasm and interest there is in uh, open source here in Nepal. Great. Yes. I'm here by force. <laughs> Yeah, and Christy, you know me. You've seen me in the emails. My voice is lost because I was in Pokhara. <laughs> and I got cold there, so this is why I speak like this. Um, I've uh, been working for our foundation for like six years as a program manager. And I've had a very, very wonderful time here. Thank you so much. <laughs> Well, we have made it around the room, and I, I have some maybe sad news for your appetite, is that we have a few more minutes for the cake to arrive. Oh. It's coming, but while we're waiting, we'll go ahead and get into, we've got some lightning talks prepared, and we'll do a little bit of introductions about getting to know the Fedora community a little bit more as we're celebrating our 20th anniversary. And uh, you'll get to hear from many of our folks up on stage here about about teams in the project, about recent changes that came in the last release, and a few other things as well. Uh, but if you all would like to take a seat here in the front, you're welcome to take a seat. Uh, so before we get in, I'm just going to do a quick overview. I'm going to talk about three things. I don't know if it's uh, possible. Are we able to put a page on the screen? Okay. I'll improvise for a few minutes. Uh, but the Fedora project, or maybe I'll pull up some Uh, so the Fedora project is, like I said this morning, it is, a, it is an operating system, uh, and we uh, provide different, ah, perfect. Can we open those two links? I'm 
not sure where the output, oh, is it? It's here. So while that's coming up, what I said this morning in the opening part, the official what is Fedora statement is the Fedora project is a community of people, as we've met, uh, working together to build a free and open source software platform and to collaborate on and share user focused solutions built on that platform. Or in plain English, we make an operating system and we make it easy for you to do useful stuff with it. So part of that deliverables that we produce is uh, making an operating system is we have something called additions. And I believe right now we have five additions. So there's five different kind of use cases that you can use Fedora with. Uh, one of the ones you'll probably see a lot here at Gnome Asia is Fedora Workstation, which is an addition of Fedora that you can install on a laptop or a computer. You can actually, you know, it's got a graphical user interface. You can click around. It's got the browser. It's got all your kind of your typical desktop experience. So if you want to use Fedora on your own hardware, Fedora Workstation is what you go with. But we also have a few other additions as well. We have a Fedora Server Edition, which is a powerful, flexible operating system that includes some of the best and latest data center technologies. So if you're doing more of a traditional server operating system model, uh, you can use Fedora Server to get some of the latest and greatest uh, technology in the kind of, you know, no graphical user interface here, but if you're running an application or deploying an app. Oh, perfect. Can we scroll down on this page just a little bit? Yeah, just down here. Perfect. There's five little boxes. That's what I want to talk about. So Fedora Server, that's your more traditional server platform. We also have Fedora Cloud, which is a, it's a pretty minimal install of Fedora, but say you're working in a public or a private cloud environment, uh, Fedora Cloud is the image you would grab to you know, set up your environment uh, in, a, in a public cloud. You know, it's very lightweight, it's used with a lot of container use cases, uh, it's probably the leanest of the images, um, but again, they're, they're, it's a customized specifically for both public and private cloud use cases. Probably two of the more uh, unusual additions, I guess you could say. We also have an IoT addition. So say you're doing, again, like earlier I was talking about that, that drone use case uh, with the team doing stuff here in Nepal with drones. I don't think they were using Fedora IoT, but if you were going to use an operating system for your control or on some device, whether it's a drone or some kind of other smart or wearable, you know, tiny little thing like a wristwatch or you know, something that's got very low computing resources, Fedora IoT is going to be a platform that you can use to build a trusted, secure, and uh, I think secure is kind of the big piece there for building an IoT, you know, uh, product. And then finally, CoreOS, which uh, this is one that's uh, kind of also a very specific use case, but usually if you're running, doing stuff with containers, which is more in like the system administration, DevOps kind of bucket, uh, CoreOS fits into that one. People can use it to, uh, it has a different updating method than the traditional uh, way that the other Fedora editions work. Um, but again, very usually cloud focused. If you're doing a lot of work with containers or you're using container orchestration software like Kubernetes or OpenShift, you'll see CoreOS come up a lot more there. So these are kind of the main, the main deliverables that we have as a project. But one of the things that I'm really excited about, if you could scroll back to the top of the page for me, is that the Fedora project is also a registered digital public good with the Digital Public Goods Alliance, which is a multi-stakeholder group with UNICEF and mul multiple different UN agencies and public nonprofits. So Fedora is a, it is a public good that is you know, created by the community for the community. Uh, and there's a little more information on, this is on our, our main website, fedoraproject.org. I think you can click and learn a little bit more about the digital public good piece. Um, but that's something that I think is really important because it really underscores what we're trying to do in the project. We could open up the, the second link to the docs.fedoraproject.org page.
while that's coming up, I just wanted to talk about uh, probably something else I think is really important to understand about Fedora is that we have some really strong values as a project. Uh, and these are something that we call our four foundations. Perfect. Can you scroll down just a bit? So we'll move this one right to the top. A little bit more. Perfect. Or a little bit uh, lower again. <laughs> Um, so freedom, friends, features first, or the four Fs. This is something that if you talk to someone who's been in the Fedora community for a while, this is something that it's, it's special to me because people really, uh, this is really important to a lot of people in our community. And I think when you ask people why, why they do Fedora or why uh, they participate in the project, usually it's either one or sometimes even all of these things that people get really fired up about. I think they also help describe what makes Fedora different from other Linux distributions. Freedom is that we believe strongly in free and open source software. When you get Fedora, everything, that, all those additions I was just talking about, everything you find in Fedora, except for wireless firmware drivers, is all free and open source software. So everything you're getting in Fedora is licensed under an open source license. You can. All those four freedoms I was talking about this morning, read, run, revise, redistribute, everything that's going into Fedora, you can do all of those four things with everything in the operating system. And we care about that. That's really important for us. We're not going to put proprietary software in the distribution. Uh, friends, I think, is probably the one that a lot of people in our community identify with. We, are really, we have strong connections to each other as a community. Uh, many of us, there's people who are new and old in the project and getting to connect with each other, uh, at a, whether it's events or online or doing things together as a project, we really care about you know, being together as a project and we, we, we care about each other. It's, it's also a, a very human part of what we do and I think that's really important when thinking about the Fedora project. Ooh, we've got a good segue here. So before we cut the cake, I'll give you the last two Fs. Features, features and first kind of go together, honestly. Features, we're always trying to bring the latest and greatest innovation that's in the Linux operating system space to users, and we try to do it first. Being big about innovation, we're doing a new release every six months. You know, we just did Fedora Linux 39 in October. In April, we're gonna be doing it all over again, and we're gonna be bringing all these new changes, which you'll hear about in a little bit from some of our speakers. Uh, but I think it's time to dig in and have some cake. So let's take a look at what we've got over here. And if you didn't already know, we're celebrating two things. I said in the beginning, it is the 20th anniversary of Fedora. Last month was actually, November 3rd was our 20th anniversary date. So we are celebrating 20 years as a community together and we're happy to share that here with you all together. And we're celebrating our last release that happened last month as well, Fedora Linux 39. need to have like a drum roll for this big reveal here. Yeah. <laughs> 